Previously on The Sean Ryan Show. This is going to be your last interview on Mogadishu and what happened in Somalia. What hurts me the most about the trash bags. Talking to one of the spouses whose body parts were in that trash bag. And she can't use trash bags. This past weekend, we all reacted with anger and horror as an armed Somali gang desecrated the bodies of our American soldiers and displayed a captured American pilot. I remember getting nervous, but still like, uh, we're gonna be home for dinner, right? You know, just joking around. And then another RPG, and I remember looking up and seeing it hit the helicopter, the tail of the helicopter. You saw it hit. Yeah, and it just started auto-rotating. I'm like, oh man, no, 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 you know? These tragic events raise hard questions about our effort in Somalia. I saw a guy across the street pop out with an AK and aim it up. He either shot him right in the head or whatever. He disappeared in the room, his weapon flew out the window. Was that your first kill? The guy on the roof? Yeah. So that yeah. was exciting for you? It was. So I don't get this detail, typically, and it still hurts, you know? Yeah. It's funny, people say, well, tell me about Somalia. Well, let's talk about Somalia instantly. I feel it, you know? Is there anything that could have been done after that operation that could have improved your, your mental state for the rest of your career? Talking about it. Getting everybody together to talk about it. All right, Tom, welcome back for day two. All right, ready to do it. <laughs> All right, man. Well, we covered your as much as of your career as we can cover in one day yesterday. And um, today we're kind of getting into some of the the other side of this coin, you know, and, and what it's like coming into civilian life. But before, before we get post-retirement, I just want to backtrack and I want to talk about what are some of the things that you're dealing with in some of the things that you're 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 using to cope with with the experiences that you've had throughout your career. I mean a lot of guys, you know, a lot of guys resort to booze, a lot of bar fights, a lot of women problems, a lot of pills, a lot of drugs. Some of them pushed on you from I've had stuff pushed on me from units and commands. Maybe you have, I don't know, but but it's a it's a ongoing discussion and um, more and more just unravels as time goes on. So I'm just wondering what are some of the things you were doing behind the scenes? All of that. All of that. And that started towards the end of my career. I couldn't tell you what year. Um, you know, hiding the drinking, going home at night and drinking literally all night until I passed out. And then returning to work the next day and doing all that. It was, um, you know, struggling to stay on top, struggling to feel relevant, getting older, getting weaker, you know, body's breaking down and all these kids are coming up. And, and it's just embarrassing to start getting passed in a run or a race or a team event. You're starting to be the last guy in the team event, you know, and, you're, and it's just that, that shameful feeling of, man, I'm not capable of being here anymore. Uh, so all the drinking started, the uh, suicidal ideation, the worthlessness, the, you know, I just want to crash my tree into a bridge abutment, you know, and just thinking that all the time. Thinking about suicide a lot, but never with a pistol, you know? And so let me break it down a little mm -hmm. bit more because I feel like we're, it's too broad of a spectrum. <clears throat> what, was, what was family life after Mogadishu? What did that like? What was that like coming home to your wife? Cold. I think I was cold. That wasn't one of the great marriages that I had anyway, and it wasn't one of the more affectionate ones. It was just, but I had definitely changed. I know my my first wife has passed, and and she was close friends with my sister, 
And so I had this story in my head of her boyfriend came and I cleaned my house out with her and she moved back and I didn't blame her because I was never home. And uh, it was probably 95, 94. So about a year after I got back from Samoa, we divorced. It just wasn't, my head was in never happening again, right? So I'm mm -hmm. always at work doing the same things at work, never home. And I'd get up, I don't know, four in the morning and ride my bike to work. And then I'd work out. And then I'd take a shower and eat breakfast and we'd shoot all day, you know, and then work out and then CQB and then ride my bike home after a workout. And just, that's late in the evening. And I'm smoked. I go to bed. We didn't talk. It was, I don't know. I didn't have the feelings to talk. I didn't have any emotions. So that just crumbled. Did you realize what was happening? No, at that point I just, uh, I thought about work. Was there even any talk of post-traumatic stress, TBI, anything at that point? Nothing. Time? Not, a, not a thing about it. Just put your head down and get to work. I didn't tell anybody I was divorcing. It's just, I think my team knew. And uh, I came back from a trip. I think in Israel, and uh, my house was cleaned out. Nothing left but a lawn chair. I actually had to go get the lawn chair out of the shed in the back, and I laid in that for that night. And thought, well, you know, the next day, it's a funny thing, the next day I got up, and my team had come over and helped help me roof my house, you know, take off shingles and start this huge pile inside of the yard and help me roof the house. And then I, we took off to Israel. When I came back, a friend of mine who had stayed back uh, for, for school or something, I called him, I go, that crazy lady even took the shingles on the side of the house and he had loaded them up and taken them to the dumpster while we were gone. And he's like, oh, he started laughing because that was me, man. I was like, she took it all, even the shingles on the pile side of the house, but non-existent relationship. And then that was followed up by a two-year marriage. Two-year marriage. Yeah, that was, uh, she ended up having, I found out she was having an affair for like probably 18 months to two years we were married because I was gone all the time. And again, it was like, all right, I got it. Later, you know, I got a phone call one day. Some guy we were trying to hire at work. He wanted to work at work. She's like, oh, I've been having that, you know, affair with this dude. I'm like, oh, really? Well, I'll be home in a minute, you know. <laughs> Looked at the team guys, and I was like, all right, I'm going to go home and end this relationship, guys. And guess who it was? And I told him, and, you know, my friends were like, that's it. That dude's done. But, you know, that's just emotional talk from my friends. And I just went home. and Another guy at the unit? Yeah. You know, your friends are like, I'm going to go crush that dude. I'm like... Really? I mean, we all know who we are, right? I mean, when it happens to us, it's different, you know, in question form. So it's that judgment that we give on everyone else, yet we're doing the same thing, right? Yeah. We're doing the same things at the time. So got married a third time, and that's when I had a child. And uh, I thought that would make it better. That's your son? Yeah. What's his name? Thomas. And I thought having a kid would make it better. And it was one of those, as soon as she gave birth... I went to Bosnia, gone for three months, you know, and, and she had postpartum. I didn't know at the time her mother had to come over and help her. You know, she was having suicidal ideation, trying to take care of this kid. I never got told any of that until later. You know, in that relationship, maybe on average, you know, relationship, still always gone. When I'm home, I'm training. When I'm home, I'm really not mentally home. I'm thinking about what's next. So again, over... 10 year period we grew apart and that that took me through retirement and then like, like i said probably about two weeks after the day i retired i was in a mon jordan for a year and a half so it was one of those you know we'll make money and that'll make it better and uh i still didn't try to get help i, I drank everything in jordan you know it was just all the guys with me all sf guys retired all the same everyone the same hiding it drinking it away. Every now and then you'd hear little stories and you're like, oh, I kind of get it, you know. And back to drinking it away. Well, when did you start the, when did you start the medications and the coping and with it when you were in? Uh, one time, one of the docs called me in the office and I was having issues at work. Like I couldn't focus. I never slept. Um, I was just always wired, just wired. And I, and I started noticing I'm wound tight. I went and talked to one of the docs and told him how I was feeling. He's like, oh, here, Prozac, you need this. Congratulations, you lasted longer than I thought, you know? And I was like, oh, what's well, everybody on Prozac here? And I started taking it. And that's the first time I started taking naps in the middle of the day. I'm like, man, I need, I need to sleep. And I just started feeling like a zombie. So I think two and a half weeks after taking it, maybe a little longer, I just stopped taking it because I didn't like it. And I think a couple weeks later, I went and told the doc, hey, he's like, how you doing? I'm like, I quit taking that shit. He's like, 
you, you need to taper off that stuff. Well, I go, I could just quit it, you know. And I had, you know, I had issues after quitting it, but um, I didn't want it. I didn't want to feel that way, you know. I felt like I was, you know, dulling my blade or something. So I didn't want to take that. So I refused. I didn't. I didn't look for any treatment after that. I thought, well, it's just going to make me asleep, make me a zombie. I don't want to be that zombie. I need to be awake and do my do my thing. So I didn't take anything after that until after I met Jen and until after I had nearly ruined everything with her. You know, I, I used to tell her, you know, don't tell me I'm at rock bottom. I pulled well, out a jackhammer. How did you meet Jen? How did I meet her? It was at work. We were actually, I was retired, and I passed the Amon Jordan time and into contracting. And we were making a video for another operator who was doing um, like an event, you know, a fun event kind of thing um, where special ops guys come in and teach you how to put on your kit, teach you how to wear it, teach you how to CQB, and then you go in and you shoot zombies, right? And it was kind of fun. It was like doing a RMTs, but with zombies, you know, you didn't really have to die. We did that for a bit. Um, I met her filming for it, like shooting a reel for it. And I didn't really know who she was. I didn't really pay attention to her. I was in a miserable 268 pound state, you know, knowing I was 268 pounds, telling myself it was muscle, but knowing I hadn't worked out in a year and a half. So I was just trying to stay relevant, but I didn't care about anybody. And somebody brought her in and was like, hey, this is, uh, you know, Tom from Black Hawk Down. And, and uh, I just kind of looked, hey, and looked back and that was it. And I think they came later and like, we're gonna go to the hospital. We hear it's haunted, you wanna come? I'm like, no, I don't, you know, I just sat there on that couch, like whatever. Filmed the whole thing, um, got back, and one of my friends was like, did you see that hot chick, you know? And I'm like, which one, the Asian? Because I, I remember, like, two girls there. I don't, I, you know. He's like, no, 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 this one. He pulls up her picture, and I'm like, oh. Saw it on LinkedIn. And I sit in there, staring at her picture, and I was like, man, she's gorgeous. How did I miss that, you know? How did I miss that? My eyes and head were down. I was just miserable. And so I linked into her, you know? And at some point she accepted it. And uh, the next time we got together to do more filming, it's like, hey, my pickup line was, hey, I linked into you. You know, I was like one of those, how cool is this? <laughs> I had no game, I had no game. Uh, been married my whole life, even multiple times, but I had no game. And uh, just kind of started talking. We started working together, filming. I'd help her film, you know, if the helicopter's coming in, her shirt flies up, I'd hold it down kind of thing and making sure she stayed safe from the explosive charges. And I'd sit her up like, stay right here behind this iron beam, that wall is gonna blow open soon and a team of seals are gonna come through and you're gonna video the whole thing after the smoke clears, but don't move from this spot and I'll tell you when the countdown's coming, you know. I'd run around, make sure everything else was set, the teams would move up and I'd go and I'd grab her and just hold her behind while we get the best shot possible. I just kind of grew from there, um, got to know her more, appreciated her work ethic. You know, when I'm walking around as the leader of the target and all the other role players in Op 4, you know, the seals are gone or the SF guys are gone and, now I'm picking up brass, I'm picking up targets, I'm cleaning up this warehouse building, and she's right beside me picking up brass with me, picking up, you know, flashbangs off the ground, making sure we leave nothing behind. And we popped out, and all my role players and all my leaders are just telling stories and cracking jokes, and here this camera lady is following me around, working still. I just screamed at him. I'm like, you know, I didn't scream at him. I think I shamed him a little bit with, uh, if I'm picking up brass and you're telling jokes, you're wrong. I go, if the camera lady's picking up brass, you're way wrong, you know? They were like all embarrassed and started picking up shit, you know? It's one of those things that I just started to protect her on target, you know? And then it kind of fell into, uh, she's really cute, you know? And then I think, I think, she might correct me because my memory's shit. I think one night in a Connex at Fort Benning, filming the Rangers, we ended up in Connex for a long time, staring out a window from the corner. I think I probably touched her hand with my hand like, you know, like, oops, sorry, that's okay. And I'm like, oh, really, you know? And I think I kissed her for the first time in that Connex because it was dangerous and fun, and and it kind of went from there. That's cool, man. Yeah, it was it was uh, unexpected, but but fun. And she was so nice, I kept thinking, what do you want? You know, like, what do you want? What What's the hook here? What's the catch? Because when you're nice, you want something. Because I wasn't around niceness a lot. And so it was attractive, but also like, what is this, you know? So it made it more interesting. How long have you guys been married now? Oh, eight, eight years. Let's go, I wanna pick up here, but let's go back just a little bit to Amon Jordan. Cause that sounds like that was kind of the start of what really turned into the downward spiral. 
Am I correct? Yeah, I'd, I'd say it was the flow through. It was a good connector after I got out. Had I stayed with that, like a lot of guys get out and they look for that thing. They'll go OGA, they'll go do contract work. They want to keep going. I wanted to train and teach. I didn't want to keep doing that because a lot of guys had died doing that. I'm like, I don't want to just show up in a country and I'm standing next to a former cop and somebody else I don't know who needed to make money too. And I'm like, all right, let's go. And I'm like, I don't know you guys. I don't want to do that. Yeah. So when that job came up in Amman, Jordan, it was it was one of those, oh, it's on a range, it's teaching, SF guys flow through there a lot, you know, so that'll be fun. I get to see some of the guys again and train them as they go into Iraq and coming out and training. And so that was good. And then that turned into a um, General Harold had pulled me aside. He said, hey, we want to start up a new program for the Prince. And he, we want you to train the Jordanians to be special forces qualified. So I, I designed a four month course of, you know, we didn't do the medical stuff other than basic medical, you know, and shooting, heart humping, you know, land nav, CQB, and things like that. Taught them as much as we could through the ITARs, um, making it legal, obviously. And that lasted a good year and a half before the money dried up, you know, whoever siphons off the top, whatever the hell. Money dried up, and so they turned it into, well, let's teach a ranger course, you know, but we won't get the barracks, we won't get this and that. You have to buy all this other stuff because the money's lower. So put them up in tents up on the hill, had everything set up for these hundred ranger, you know, wannabes to come through, and then that went away. And then Gary uh, went back for medical reasons, and a new general came in. And since I was in charge of all that, and a new general came in, he wanted to bring in his old sergeant major. So they had uh, let go of a SAS guy who was expected to take everything over. And then the general called a meeting with everybody. Everybody was like, oh, Tom, man, you're going to get promoted. You're going to be the dude that runs this whole thing. This will be awesome. you know." And I'm like, I just want to run this program. Oh, you're going to be the guy that's running all these things. And I went in there and sat down and uh, picked up my notebook, ready to listen to what he had to say. And he said, uh, our company no longer needs you. Um, appreciate your time with us. Any questions? I closed my book and I set it down. I looked at him. I go, I guess one. Why? <laughs> you know, his answer was moving in a different direction. I go, all right. I stood up and turned around. He goes, you have anything else? And I just walked out the door. And there was a third group was there. And I knew a bunch of guys in third group. And a good friend of mine was there. Packed all my shit in a bag real quick. They wanted a turnover from me, you know. Packed all my shit in a bag. I looked at Joey and I go, can you throw this in your ass? You go get it back from your Fort Bragg. He goes, you know it, brother. I go, hey, I have all your training schedule, but it's leaving with me. I'm sorry. Take it up with the uh, with the people here. And he's like, what happened? I go, I'm leaving, man. He's freaked out. He was so mad because he knew everything was going to go to shit. You know, we'd set it all up. So they ended up finishing their time out, brought my stuff back. I got on a plane that night and flew back. And everybody's like, where'd you go? And I go, all my stuff's in a bowl, man. You no longer needed me. I'm a contractor. Later, you know, I owe you nothing now. And so I packed up, and that's when it kind of really hit me. Like, here we go again. I felt like another admin betrayal. Like, I'm getting ready to get promoted to the top. And you just let get, get let go. And all the guys behind you are emailing you, this sucks, this place sucks, they're really blowing it. And then it all shut down within about six months. Damn. It all shut down. And so my days turned into sleeping all day and watching TV all night while snacking and drinking, and sleeping all day. And they ended up moving out of my my bedroom with my wife and moving into the spare bedroom because it was one of those, you're keeping me up and I got to work. And I'm like, okay. And I just moved into the spare bedroom across from my son's room and uh, I'd lay in there all day and then watch TV all night until I got that call to go do, hey, we're going to video this uh, thing for zombie killing and we need some special ops guys. I'm like, what's it pay? Because now I'm just looking to make some money, you know, and I'll do anything to do that. How old was your son at this time? Hmm. <laughs> Five, six, no. Um, what year is this? Wow, he's four or five. Hang on. What? Eleven? So, yeah, my son was eleven. <laughs> eleven years old? Wow, yeah. <clears throat> what was your relationship like with your son? I'd tell him I loved him. Um... I think I tried to teach him too many lessons at 11 years old. I think that made me hard on him. Like if he slept in too late, you know, I'd try to wake him up. If he slept in again, I'd, and then one time I come in there banging pots and pans, he freaked out and woke up. Like, ah, that's what you got to get up. You know, what was I doing, right? I was using the tools that I knew from basic training and from being violent and aggressive to try to teach him lessons at 11 years old. 
And though I told him I loved him, I don't, you know, I didn't show it really. So I think he picked up on that. And that, that broke my heart along with a lot of things coming back from deployments when he's younger and trying to hold him and he freaks out because he'd annoy him. He's crying and wailing and I mean, all that painful. Your son doesn't know you and it's your fault. He felt like a complete stranger? Yeah, yeah. And he felt like you were a complete stranger? Oh, for sure. He's 23 now and we're still working back into it. We talked the other day and he's like, hey, you know, I'm getting better socially and, and, and you know, and I, I understand the things you went through now and I appreciated it and I appreciate um, everything. I'm like, well, you know, we'll just hopefully can work this into another relationship as two adults. And so that's what we're trying to do now. And it's all my fault for being gone, you know, and I just tell people it's choices you make. I couldn't connect with him. He was too young, different, you know, points of view, different places in life. And I never considered that. Like, you're a boy, you're my son. And I'm trying to connect with you. Why didn't I just get down on the floor and lay there? And you could have climbed over top of me as the mountain, you know, or just to play with him um, instead of trying to build some boy who could care for himself early on in life. You know, my, my mind was, my job is to make you able to survive alone. And that's how I handled it. So it wasn't very fatherly wasn't nurturing from my side. And I don't think he got it from his mother, who was probably hurting, obviously, at the time, and, and dove herself into work as well. So I think he was kind of parentless a bit. When did you realize, when did you realize you needed to take on a different role and start to mend that relationship? I think when he came to live with Jen and I, and then I immediately went off on another training trip, like to New Mexico, and I was gone for a bit and he started acting out, smashing his computer, punching the wall, uh, cutting a little bit. When Jen was home and I'd get phone calls, hey, your son did this. And I'd get him on the phone and go, what's your deal, man? Here I am on the phone again instead of flying home. And, and yelling at him to stop, like that'll work. Stop acting like a fool, you know? And still never considered it was me that made him act out like that. And Jen would try to talk to him. You know, your dad does a lot. You don't know what he did, you know, and yada, yada. And he goes, and I don't care. I just wished you work at Home Depot so I could see him. When I heard that, that he didn't care what I did, and I thought, man, he'd be so proud of me. He didn't care, he just wanted a dad. And that's when I knew. That's really screwed it up. What were... <clears throat> What was your first step to fixing it? Leaving him alone. I really tried over and over again on text. He went back, he, he stayed with us for a year. And he went home to visit his mom, which he said he didn't want to, you know, I let him stay here, I don't wanna go back. And I made him go back to visit his mom. Go, it's your mother, you know, go visit your mother. And she's probably freaking out. And I had a feeling I said, you want to take anything with you in case you change your mind or anything? He's like, no, no, and he left stuff there. He went home, and sometime towards the end, I think we got a call or a text, and I think I'm going to stay here and go to school here. You know, I'm, I'm sure it wasn't getting talked about nicely back home. I said, all right, um, we'll pack up your stuff and send it to you, you know, and we did. And, and I kept texting and calling and texting and calling. He was ignoring it, and I... And I got some advice from Jen and then I decided to let him be for a bit. Let him determine what he wants to be, but let him know I'm there every now and then and not expect an answer, not expect um, a solution right away. And that's been, that's taken years to get to where I mean, he calls me now without, you know, it used to be a text, hey, happy Thanksgiving. And about Christmas, I'd get a thanks, dad, you know, kind of one of those, like, I'm so busy, right? And I'm like, oh, I played that game before, I understand. To now he calls me out of the blue and just wants to chat with me about how he's doing with his job and stuff. And it's, it's really, really gotten to my heart and really made me a lot happier. Uh, more uh, confident inside that I can mend this and we can get together. Is there anything you, you want to say to him right now? Yeah, that I love him more than anything on this planet. And that I'm sorry that it wasn't there for him. But I'm here now, and I want to be here for him. 
I'm sure he's going to hear that. I hope so. He will. Let's go back a little bit farther to, I think it was 2002, where some guys came home and murdered their wives. How did that impact you? To be honest, looking back, I don't think I took much stock in it. I think the feelings were, oh man, the unit's gonna look bad. Yo, that's bad for the unit, um, was probably my thought. A little thrown in, oh, those kids, you know, oh my God, you can imagine, but then that's probably the extent of it. Like, oh man, the unit really looks bad, uh, you know, and, and then those poor kids, and then that's it. I didn't think about, man, what were they going through behind closed doors? What was that relationship like for that to happen? I mean, what brings people to that? And that was the first time I think we'd ever experienced anything like that. Um, but still, I didn't take many stock in it. And I, don't even, I couldn't tell you what the unit did about it. I couldn't tell you. I just don't know. When did that hit you? When did that, when did that hit you that, okay, something's going on that we don't know about? For me or the unit? For the, for the, I mean, that was in 2002. That was early. You know, I think, didn't you, you retired in 2013? And 10. You didn't put much stock into it? No. And you know what? Still, they don't put much stock into it. You call organizations and offer up a retreat free. We'll fly you in, you know? Oh, just come on. Just show up. An organization's like, we have our own thing. We do our own thing. And I'm like, you know, I came from this organization. What, what thing are you doing there? You know, because everybody's calling and wanting these, but I offered it to the organization. They're like, we're doing our own thing, you know, and then another suicide, another thing that goes wrong. It's like the organizations that are higher up try to hide the negativity so they don't get looked at poorly, you know, or regulated or, or whatever would, would happen. So I think we internalize a lot of that stuff and hold on to it and keep it at the lowest level possible which means we don't run it up at flagpole, which means they don't get the statistics, which means they're not really aware of what's going on at the higher levels, or they're also complicit and they know and they don't do anything about it. So they're still, to this day, just dipping their toe in the water on what to do with this. And that's why they're so behind. You, you know, the military, the government, and they're, it's like a big ship in the ocean. Once you turn it, it's gonna take a long time to fully turn around and go in the other direction. Yeah, It's just a big, slow process. Yeah. And then there's money. Right, then there's money. What, there's just so many aspects to getting out, you know? And uh, so what was, I mean, I've, I've been in the SEAL teams, I've been in the agency, I've interviewed guys from just about every unit there is. And I will say that as toxic as I, as toxic as I think the SEAL community is, I think that the Delta community is definitely the most toxic from my from my vantage point. And I've interviewed a number of you guys. Nobody seems to leave there on good terms. <laughs> if they do leave there on good terms, terms go to shit later on. And um, I'm wondering what is the interaction between you and the unit and some of your old teammates, friends, you know, a lot of us consider them family. What, what was that like when you left? in Jordan and you're hearing the guys, everything from the way you left to hearing the guys go on and do more missions and more missions. I mean, I know what that's like too. What, how did that affect you? It broke me down. It was like a boot in the ass on the way out, you know, jumping off that fast moving train and you get assisted with a boot in the ass. And then you realize that train's gone. Your tribe's gone. Everything you did is gone. And you gotta be, you feel betrayed at the end. And it's just, it crushes everything you've ever done. I felt completely worthless. I felt like a fraud. I felt like I'd let the unit down still. You know, I let the unit down, man. You know, how dare I? And it was never self-directed feelings. You know, I don't think any of us had those out there. It's all cutthroat. It's all comparison when you're out there. How good is that person? I need to do that. I need to be better than that. The competition was relentless and it just drives you through the roof. And I realized every day, I told myself I needed to be better. My mind hears, you're not good enough. And so I just 
didn't realize t- down the road that, man, I'm putting a lot of pressure on myself. I'm trying to do these things. You know, even though I'm no longer in the unit, I'm still trying to be better than whoever's around me as much as I can. And I don't think I was being a good leader. I was running the whole organization. But when you bring in the right people, they run themselves pretty much. I think I was burning out. I was getting tired, you know, probably over drinking. Well, I was over drinking. It's probably what making me was tired. And, and I didn't have the love in the job anymore. It was just going downhill. And I, and I just could feel myself sinking into this hole in the earth and, and just going away and being irrelevant. And I was grasping for relevancy. I was grasping for attention. I was grasping for someone to look at me and say, hey, you're okay. You're good to go. You know, you're cool. And when you leave, nobody does that. Do I have friends in the unit now? No. Do I know a lot of people from the unit? Yes. Do I have acquaintances? Yes, I have very few friends from the unit that I talk to. I check up on a lot of people. But whether it was the book that came out and people were pissed for not knowing what was in it, right? Unless they read it, then they wouldn't be pissed. Or for just the loyalty to the unit. Or, you know, when the older guys, when they got out, it's just they kind of move on with their lives after a bit. And so the transition of you getting out, you're listening to the news, you're texting your boys, is that who's that? Is that you? Who got killed? You know, was that us? You know, wondering, trying to stay relevant to, you know, no more texting. No more connection, no more, you know, that, that brotherhood is gone. The train's moved on, and you move on with your life, and other guys move on with their life. To where I don't even want to go back to the unit. I hadn't much for the annual informals and formals. Just sick to my stomach. Just sick to my stomach to go back and think what's going on. Even going back to Fort Bragg makes me sick to my stomach. I could feel the testosterone. I could feel how I felt back then. We don't. When we go back now, we stay out in Southern Pines. I just... I have to get away. I can't be around the 82nd dudes, the military guys that's stacked on top of each other, drinking, and just I can't be around that environment um, anymore. It's just toxic to me. So I choose to stay away from that and enter into a more calmer, a gentler life. And that's helped a lot. That's helped a lot, giving up who I was and, and accepting who I can be and not thinking I peaked. You know, I'm, No, I'm going to peak doing this. I think I've saved more lives doing this than I ever did working. I think you're right. At least American right. lives, <laughs> you know. <clears throat> Let's move on past. We, we we had covered talking to Jen. You guys bet. Had your first kiss on the Connex box. How romantic. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> At night, it was hot as hell, yeah. But um, how did that, I mean, I know that you guys started off pretty rocky, correct? Very rocky. Like rock stars, partiers. I mean, we were probably using each other, you know. I think we were using each other, not knowing what would do, what it would be. She was a partier too, huh? Oh, yeah. She didn't deny anything we were going to go to. <laughs> she hung in there, actually. Hung in there. Um, and that was impressive. You know, she would hang in there with us and still give it to the guys who were doing wrong, you know, when they wanted help. I mean, she wouldn't be one of those wagging fingers at people, but... Just kind of make you think about what you're doing, you know, and that's what attracted people to her to start talking to her about what's wrong with me, by the way. You noticed it. What's up? You know, why do I feel this way? More like a den mother for the guys, you know, the seals on target, the controllers, then the seals who stayed around and had seen her before on a different, you know, set up a different iteration. Hey, Jen. They always remember the blonde hair girl, you know, hey, Jen, I was with her. You know, nobody wants to talk to Tom, but that attracted people and her demeanor, and they just started sharing their stories with her about their family and wanted to propose to their girlfriends and, and, and she got to know them and then they wouldn't come back from deployments. She'd ask around, hey, it's team, team four, where's, you know, where's Bob? Bob didn't, Bob didn't make it, you know. Where's Mike? And Mike didn't make it, he was with Bob, you know, and it just happened over and over again. And it just one of those days, you know, as our relationship grew, she decided I can't, I can't prepare people to go to war anymore. I have to help them come home. So she pulled out of that job and started working on her nonprofit, building it from scratch, not knowing what we were doing. Uh, well, I, I continued to work so we could eat food while we did it. And then uh, started from there, you know, just trying to help others. It, what, <clears throat> at what point do you think you hit your lowest 
what point in time did you hit your lowest point? Was it after meeting Jen or was it before? My wedding night. Your, your wedding night. What's there about it? I screwed that up too. The wedding day was going well, Savannah, Georgia. Our small group of former employees would be there. They were around. We decided to get married on Tybee Island, get on Tybee Beach at sunset. And uh, we didn't want anybody there. We didn't want our friends there. We didn't want them on the beach. We wanted it private. We'd link up with you later, you know, and have drinks. So we got dressed early, drove down to Tybee, probably had a drink before we left. Pulled over to another bar that we used to hang out, you know, that shot. Pulled down to another bar on the way. Probably both of us were nervous as hell. Because we were planning on getting married overseas somewhere, a destination wedding, Bora Bora, something like that. We were looking to buy a house together in St. Louis, because I still lived in Savannah. And they wouldn't give us the loan for the VA unless we were married. And it was supposed to close on a Monday, blah, blah, blah. So I had to go to the courthouse and get a marriage certificate on a Friday. So the next Saturday we could get married and, and then Monday we would close kind of deal. It was so, ended up all being rushed. So there was stress there. And I learned out later, you know, the stress of changing jobs, the stress of buying a home, the stress of getting married all at one time, you know, it was just uh, all piled on us. So we had another drink and then we went on down for the ceremony. And there was a photographer and a, and a priest or a chaplain, whatever, who he was down there. Um, beautiful sunset ceremony it had been raining before that. So the beach had cleared. We were the only ones on the beach and the, and the rain cleared up and it was a nice little orange sunset. We got some beautiful photos, got married. And then went and met our friends. And that's when I, you know, I, I don't remember a lot of it. I ended up talking to one of our other employees' wives on, I didn't even remember that. I didn't even consider what was happening. It was just another day for me, right? Just another day. And I ended up getting drunk. And I didn't do a first dance with my wife. All the traditional things that she wanted, I was like, oh, whatever. What is, what is that? I, I didn't consider it. She got mad, obviously. Um, started to tell me about it. And, of course, when you shame me or tell me I'm wrong, you know, I go straight to rage. So I was screaming at her as we're walking home. We entered the lobby. I don't even remember this. I heard it later that one of the, the person, people in the lobby are like, are you okay? Because I'm yelling so loud because I don't, I don't care anymore, right? I don't care where I'm at. I don't care what I'm saying. I'm talking. Listen. Made her way all the way up to the bedroom. I think I threw a makeup case across the room, um, screaming and yelling, and I ended up waking up on the floor the next morning. And I'm like, oh, shit. That probably didn't go well. And she came out of the bathroom, sat on the bed, and she said, well, she's holding our paperwork. We hadn't turned it into the courthouse yet because it was a weekend. She said, I'm gonna hold on to this. I may not turn it in. I'm gonna fly home. We're going to think about this, and this may not last. And I crushed me inside. Said, man, I blew this. I had this and blew this one in a day, basically. In this day, I blew it again. And that was my worst day and the start of my best life. Because that's one of my... <sighs> that's when I made the promise to do something. That's when I was below rock bottom. That's when I realized I had crushed the person that I loved so much and had knew that I had loved her that deeply. And I crushed her and I saw in her face, I felt like nothing. That was my worst. How long did she go home for? Well, she lived there. So she, she told me on a Sunday, we sat on a bench on the beach and we talked a long time. And she said, I'm just going to go home, think about this, and I'll let you know. Um, and then she, she it wasn't long. I, I don't know if it was Sunday. She told me that she probably wouldn't, but she would think about it or if she let me sit on that for a couple of days. And uh, she finally told me, you have to get help or I'm gone. You have to do something or I'm leaving. And then with my back in the corner, I came out fighting. You know, I, I went and found a counselor that, that day, Monday, I think that Monday, I made an appointment, and it was Eric Clapton's old coach or whatever, and he knew. I mean, he knew what was up. And for the first time, I was told, you know, I had post-traumatic stress. I wasn't an alcoholic. I was a problem drinker. 
you know, I was a, that it could be, I could be helped and here's some tools to manage your anger because it was all anger management for me. That's what I thought. And so that started me picking up these little tidbits of what to do if I started to get angry. And I'd go back to work and, you know, my coworkers, like, they'd, they always talk, don't talk to Tom before 11. He's grumpy, you know, just don't talk to him. And I was because I was drunk the night before and I'm hung over at work and I'm about 11, you know, the deal. I'm like, oh, okay, maybe I'll drink again tonight after promising I'll never drink again. And they started noticing a little change. You know, it's like talking to Jen, like, what's up with Tom? He's coming up with these weird sayings and not getting mad, and, and he's a little bit different. And it felt good. It felt better, you know? So Jen obviously decided to stick around. And uh, then she got busy on, okay, what's next? What's next? You're not done yet. You know, I'm like, I'm all better now, right? I, I'm not angry, but she knew I wasn't. So we went into the trans transcendental meditation, right? And that was just a little woo-woo-y for me at the time, a little early for that, but it worked. It helped slow me down again. It helped bring me back in again. And then I started doing other modalities, which helped me sleep a little more, you know, managing my drinking, from drinking it all to, to, to working into where we make rules. You when know? you were drinking, I want, to t I want to go into all the things that helped you because it's, 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 you know, it's like a puzzle putting it all together. It all works in combination, I think. Yeah. <clears throat> but um, I, people don't understand that are listening. I understand all the guys that, the, the similar backgrounds, you know, they understand, families understand, civilians, they don't understand, and that's the majority of this audience. So right. what was, what was, just a normal day in the life of Tom Satterley. How much were you drinking? What pills were you on? What time would you take them? What was the cycle? Wow, I, I don't know how many Percocets I was on. I was in so much pain that I would take them. And it was in a culture of, I'd have jars of Percocets, you can get them. You know, and I took the biggest ones they had. And uh, you're in that culture of, Oh, my back hurts. Hey, man, you got one of those pills, right? You know, everybody's back hurts when you have Percocets. Um, and it felt good to take them because I was in pain every minute of every day. And when I take a Percocet, it was, it was, oh, what's different? Oh, I'm not in pain. Oh, I'm happy, right? I'm high. I, I, you know, and then I drink on top of that. So I'd take Percocets all day. And then alcohol would start as for early pain as, and for for pain for and it just it felt me made me feel better numb me out yeah and I took more than I should have that's for sure I'd forget I took Percocet and I want to feel a little better you need that bump you know um, smoking marijuana I was drinking from as early as in the day as I could to as long as I could or when I when I you had to end it because I just don't remember you know I either passed out or one of those. Catching a cab the next day, going around, looking at everywhere you've been, checking receipts to find your car, because at least you were smart enough to take a cab home that night. Um, just not knowing where your car was. And, and it just started hitting me that, man, I do have a problem. I, you know, if I got to chase receipts the next day to find my car, what's happening to me? Um, another perk set. You know, it's just, it was a cycle that was accepted in that culture, pushed in that culture. And what then, about sleeping pills? Oh, yeah. Gobbling up Ambien and Valiums. Yeah. That's the counter at night. I would probably take two, three Ambien at night going, that's four, six, you know, four, eight, 12 hours. I'd pop two Valium. I'd, I'd wake up and chew another Ambien, hoping it would hit me quicker and just laying in bed with my eyes open. Miserable. I couldn't sleep. Roll over, close my eyes. Thoughts. Just miserable. Couldn't sleep. You know, I was drunk. And I just roll there and lay there until I'm hung over. And then probably about four, five in the morning, I'd close my eyes and be like, ah, oh, finally. Wake up at seven, just miserable, go to work. If I wasn't late and just not talk until 11. Then go get some lunch in me and like, ah, oh, Tom's back, you know. Percocets make me happy. And that went on for a long time. The Percocets started a long time ago from the surgeries. The what drinking, about a pick me up in the morning? Adderalls, cocaine, anything like that? No, I, uh, in Jordan, 
I'd have some coffee, which I didn't drink coffee, and I'd, I'd dump a little Kahlua in there on the way to work. And I don't even know why, because it didn't do anything. But you know what I mean? As much as I drank a little, but I think it was the, I'm having a little drink, you know? So that's, that's good. Or maybe it was the party time, even though I was working. It was like a good time that we're going to have here. And then I realized... I can't do this as a leader in front of these guys because it, it, it creates an environment where it's okay for everyone else to do this, you know? How long did you stay in that cycle for? How many years? Hmm. Ten. Ten years? Maybe more. Ten's a good number. Yeah. I'd fudge a little higher if I had to. <laughs> That's a long time. It took a long time for awareness. And then when the awareness came, it took a long time for acceptance. There was more denial than acceptance. And then a slow acceptance speed. And then more awareness of more things. And then more acceptance. And then the slow process of what do I do? and roll into that, and which one do I do, and what's working, and who's just selling something they say works, to just deciding that why shouldn't I do everything I can possibly do and never stop doing it until I get where I need to be, you know? If not, I'm gonna quit, and then that's where I die. When I quit trying, that's, what I, that's where I would have died back then. Your wife, Jen, has kids, too. Yes. When did you get introduced to them, and how did that? Re how, how are those relationships back then? I think they were four and six, five and seven-ish. And when they were younger, very accepting. It's just a friend, mommy's friend, you know, and then there's daddy still. You know, they visit daddy, mommy's friend, visit daddy, mommy's friend. Never spoke poorly of their father. It's her father, you know. Um, and then when they were younger, it was like, oh, we're having fun and, you know, we're together. And then as they get older and they understand, I think the pain eases in on them. The divorce moves in on them and they start understanding more up to the point where I wrote my book and she wrote her book. And I'm pretty sure well, I know they read them. And then as children, you know, they have to work through that. And some of that comes out in anger when they're in trouble. Um, some of that just came out in sadness and other other issues. And they had to work through that, right? We had to get them to work through that with coaches and counselors as well along the way, knowing that we couldn't, you know, even though we do this, you know, we can't do this here. We have to have someone else do this. To where they grew up, grew through it and understood, you know, all right, there's a lot of people out there divorced. This isn't the end of life. I can make it through this. My mom and my dad still are friends and still talk all the time. They're still very cordial. I mean, they're friends. I mean, he's a nice guy. I'm, I mean, I'm... I, Consider him a friend. I know him, and he's a nice guy, you know? I mean, it just, nothing bad about that. I'm yeah. talking about your relationship with those kids. Yeah, I, I was hands-off for a bit. Were I knew who I was. Were you in the cycle when you met him? Oh, yeah, deep. How long were you in the cycle after you met him? Six, seven years. So, till about well, 10, uh, 11 eight. years old? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Yeah, um... To me and her son have a good relationship, and me and her daughter are getting into a good relationship. It hurt her more, I think. Um, How so? Just her age. She's a daughter of a man, and here's a new man. Um, she's smart. She picks up things, and she's, she knows how to uh, air it. And using it, you know, well, you got a divorce, you introduced him too soon, and it kind of affected me. And I'm like, how much is this? Are you reading books? Or how much is this as a true feeling coming out? Either way, it's true, you know. And it was uh, eye-opening. So I was a lot of hands off, knowing how I could react. Going through Jen, like, hey, relay this message, right? And putting her in this stressful, you know, rock and hard place. Going and telling her kids this and that. And... But I had to stay out of that. I know I couldn't manage it. You know, one day it's Thanksgiving or no, it's, it's uh, Luke's birthday. Grandma and grandpa are over, kids around the table. It's very stressful for me. Happy times are very stressful for me back then because I was jealous of it. I wished I could have that and I didn't. And so I tried to manage it, I guess. It's the only way to look at it. And so Claudia and Luke go at it, you know, the brother and sister, they go at it. Um, 
I think Claudia was getting a little antsy, a little amped up a little bit. I, I looked at her I'm like, this is Luke's birthday. Can we just have Luke's birthday, you know, or whatever it is. And he starts ramping up and they're fighting again. And I, and I and he was like, gee, you know, Jesus. And I, and I said something like, can't we just, you know, and everybody in the room's like nervous. I didn't say anything that bad, but I think everybody felt me welling up and getting red, turning into that, you know, my call sign crawler instead of Tom. And it was one of those, I realized, oh, I do get big. I do change, you know, and I, I don't want to say things like this in front of the family. And, and I kind of just remove myself. And for a while, I would always just stay very quiet on holidays. You know, hey, I'm like, ha, ha, fun, you know, and try to be there, not realizing that it's obvious when you're not happy. You're just sitting there for the moment. To just finally easing into it later in life and letting it happen when it happens versus trying to force it. And I actually think on this last vacation we took, it really was a bonding, a bonding trip because I kept my mouth shut, completely shut, did the things I needed to do and walked away from the things I didn't want to do so they could have fun doing them. If Like if they wanted to go shopping, I'm like, uh, uh-huh. I'm going to go over here and watch street performers, you know, and, and we have that relationship where, okay, we all don't need to be together. We, you go have fun here. I'm going to go watch these guys juggle knives and swords. And when you're done, let me know. And we'll find each other. And um, to the point where I, I, to tell you how life-changing it was for me, that trip, was Claudia was having conversations with me. And I remember staring her in the eyes and having that conversation and realizing as we were having it, I'd never looked her in her eyes for longer than a second. It's always at the ground, like in shame for me. And I got nervous because, oh my God, I'm looking at her eyes. Is it too long? Is it weird? Oh my gosh, because it, it was new to me. And I remember telling Jen about it later, like, oh, it was so weird, I didn't know what to do. But it made me so happy that we were connecting and having this conversation uh, about something in London. I don't even remember what it was. And it was just, we started talking more and I was listening more. She was listening to me more. And I knew she was listening because she's always been a listener with no information that she's listening unless you know her enough. But she's always listening. So that time I knew she was listening to me. And I thought, all right, this is the start of something really good now. That's good to hear, man. Yeah, it feels good. How many people other than Jen were telling you that something needs to change? Zero. She's the only one? Why do you think that is? I think people were afraid of me. I think people didn't want, family didn't want to say it, and family didn't know. I don't think my family knew. And I think I hide it. I hid it a lot from people, and I know my brothers did never bring it up because it's a mirror. It's a mirror for them. So when Jen did it, it was obviously out of love, out of strength, out of stubbornness, and uh, it, it was a shock to me to hear it straight up, hard hitting. Something's wrong with you, and if you don't start now, I'm leaving. I, I won't subject myself to this because I'm a human too. You know, I don't, I don't need to be treated this way. <clears throat> so that kind of forced me, thankfully, into taking an action. Do you think there's anybody else out there that could have called you on your bullshit that would have made you change, that would have made you start looking for answers, looking for help? Yeah, there were people I would have listened to. Who? Uh, my former boss at the company we helped co-found, had he said something, you know, just knowing who I am, I would have taken it as a work thing. And I would, oh, shit, I'm acting this way at work. I'm a loser, right? Not home life, but work life. Had he said something directly, you know, I found out later he aired out things to Jen, who would air out things to me, who I thought was coming from her. And then later it was like, no, he was saying those to me, to you. And I'm like, well, what, what the hell's wrong with that dude, right? Why would he say something to me? Man up. Right? I'm not going to punch you. And if I do, it won't hurt that long, right? Just tell me. <laughs> I mean, just man up and tell your friends yeah. they need some help, you know? But we don't want to hold that mirror up because then we would have to go get help. And it happens a lot with people that reach out for help. Immediately they're connected to help. And then they freak out. And then they don't make the calls. 
and then I have to cut them away. And then you get the hateful emails about how you're, you're, you're a quack and your system doesn't work. I'm like, no, nothing works if you don't do it. You know, a bicycle will lay there forever unless you pedal the damn thing. So the accountability is not there. The awareness of I need help, you called, you emailed, but the accountability is not there. They don't want to admit it. They don't want to put in the work. And so they shy away from it and make all the excuses. You know, I'm fine. It's quack. I'm, I'm going to go help other people now. I'm like, oh, no, you know. I think helping veterans is what will help me. And I'm like, okay, I started out in a soup kitchen, right, helping people after I, after I did the anger management while I was doing it. I was, it opened my eyes to other people and humans that needed help. I just thought, oh, you need, you need food? Go get a job, man. You know, I, I saw the human in those people, and it really opened me up. And I knew I can't go help people, right? I wouldn't take advice, marriage advice, from somebody who was never in a relationship. I wouldn't take financial advice from somebody who was broke all the time, right? So I wouldn't want another veteran taking advice from me or any other veteran that's broken at the time because I'm going to get bad advice, and that bad advice is going to take me down the wrong hole. So I would ask other people who are helping other people or want to help other people to get help first, right? At least check it out. Go talk to licensed clinical social worker, start talking honestly, and then find out if you have a problem. Because if you're telling yourself you don't, and you're all fit as a fiddle, you're probably not. I have a room of 300 people and I'll be talking on stage and how many people have a perfect relationship? No hand ever goes up. Okay, how many of you are in marriage counseling? Two hands might go up. All right, for the other 298, why aren't you in counseling? Why are you gonna wait till it's broken to maintain something? They teach us that if it's broken, it's more expensive, takes longer to fix it versus if you maintain it, it lasts longer and it's always stays stronger. So that awareness of, oh, I don't have to work on my relationship or myself until I'm really, really broken or a divorce is coming, it's too late then, right? It's a lot harder to get back up. So start now, just do the check-ins and make sure your relationship's in the right way and make sure your head's in the right space. That's good advice. <clears throat> There's one more thing that I want to hit that's a dark subject, and that's I know you had at least one suicide attempt. Are there more? How many? I don't know. Did you always have it planned out? No, it was anger-based. What would trigger it? Shame. From something I did. From hurting... Jen, yeah, and, and hurting Jen in any way would, would, when put into my face, when brought up, or when I calmed down and realized I would feel so horrible that I wanted to get away from it so fast that I started telling myself, milliseconds, you're worthless, your, your time here's over, you've done your job, you're warrior, that's all you're here to do, don't ruin this woman's life. That day, we were working together. It was, it was all right. I was feeling down. You know, my, my, I wasn't talking to my son. I was trying. I was divorcing. I knew that that was going to be another cash, will, cash windfall for somebody else other than me. I knew what was coming, and I'm still trying to work. And we wrapped up that day. I had two friends in the back seat, right? We've been riding for a while together, and they didn't know. They didn't know I'd been down that day. They jumped out of the car in the parking garage, like, see you at the bar, like always, you know. And Jen, I found out later, knew that day, all that day, that I was off. I wasn't the jovial self that I normally was. I wasn't charismatic. I was just kind of quiet. That whole day was my son's thoughts of my son were weighing on me. Not the fact that I was getting divorced, the thoughts of what a shitty father I had been. Um, and here I am again, right, leaving his mother. And we got to that garage and my two friends took off and then Jen, I normally helped her carry stuff in. Um, she's starting to grab her bags and I said, I gotta make a phone call. You know, in the parking garage, I'm gonna make a phone call. And I just said that to get alone. I just needed to be alone. As soon as she turned the corner down the hallway, you know, from the parking garage, I pulled my pistol out. And when I charged it, you know, I was looking around like I'm gonna get in trouble and I don't wanna be seen. And then I, I remember thinking, Oh, the poor people in the rental car company that finds this car. And I remember thinking, I hope I do this right, because I don't want to end up, you know, just screwed up and have somebody have to take care of me and wipe my mouth all the time. And I just, uh, 
And my phone starts vibrating and ringing and I'm ignoring it. And I'm just, I'm not thinking of war. I'm not thinking of anybody that died. I'm just thinking of what a loser I was. And I was hoping I could do it, you know? And the phone kept going off and I finally picked it up to look like, God. And all I saw was a bunch of stuff, a bunch of missed calls. And I, and I saw something, something you're late. And when I saw you're late, I went right back to work. I'm like, I'm never late. I'm never, ever late. You know, plus or minus 30 seconds anywhere in the world, right? And I'm like, I'm never late. Clear my pistol, put it back in my bag and grabbed all my stuff and went running down, you know, like, what am I late for? And she's like, well, let's just go have a seat, you know, and talk. We went and sat in the corner. Everybody else was getting drunk over here. We went and sat in a dark corner and just talked for a long time. I didn't tell her. I didn't, I didn't want to tell her. I, I thought I'd never do this again. I was crazy. I was terrified me. It, it literally terrified me, thinking of how close I was. And uh, I think two months later, I told her, and it really struck her. It really struck her. And that might have been the breaking of her wanting to help people. It might have been like one of the, one of the push, things that pushed her over the top. And then... There's been times, I mean, obviously I got to work after our, our, our wedding night, but, you know, it's a long process. You got to be diligent. You got to be patient. And I wasn't patient. I wasn't getting well quick enough. Uh, Jen was new to it. So every time I did one thing, she wanted me to do another. And then she'd ask another. And to me, I'm hearing I'll never be good enough. She keeps wanting me to do more, which means I'm not getting there. And I just, fights would break out over... I don't know. I couldn't tell you what they were for. They were stupid. They were all stupid. Um, but I would go to shame, embarrassment, and then want to end it. You know, screw this. I'll just, ah, and I'm banging a pistol off my head. I've grabbed it from underneath the couch or underneath the mattress before, going to the lockbox and just smacking it off my head, just banging it off my head, screaming, ah, I just want to do this right in front of her. Never considering what it was doing to her. I didn't care about me, and I cared about her, and I hated me for hurting her. She said, cycle, you know, how do I break this cycle? I'm not on the bad side. And we just kept going. We just kept going, and her patience just kept pushing and pushing, and her, and her kindness and love, no matter how much I pushed her away. She came back strong, and she kept offering different alternatives, and I just kept taking them. Even to the even while we were going through this, people on Facebook and social media were like, "You guys are the best couple, you know, blah blah blah. You're you're the you know the epitome of relationships." And I'm like, "Don't you know what Facebook is? Take Facebook and, and apply it to your life." We don't get on there and go, "Man, we're fucked up. We fight. All, I'm sorry, we fight all the time, you know. And we, yeah, and we scream at each other. I mean, we kind of do now, and we did in our books to open people's eyes. But back in the time, it was just happiness, right? Everybody does happiness, the good side." So I think that's hurting people not realizing there's a bad side too. And that side needs the attention. The good side is getting attention. The bad side needs attention. And that's where we need to pay attention. So we're honest about everyone. Hey, our life isn't like you see. We, we post other things now. We talk about other things now. But, but be aware that our life is not perfection. We're not those people that get on stage and talk about the things we're not doing. And we're also not those people who are perfect I think we were told one, I know I was told one time, we were told that I'm going to video you guys talking to each other and fighting, and I'm going to play it back for you so you realize what you say on stage you don't do. Thinking you think Brene Brown's perfect, doesn't feel shame? Think Tony Robbins doesn't feel like shit sometimes? You know, or does counter to what he preaches? We all do. But we get back on the horse and we try our hardest to get back, you know, in the race. <clears throat> so there's a lot of judgment out there, and I'd rather there be more curiosity as to how to get here. I think we should take a break, and when we come back, we'll bring Jen on. I want to get her side of this. That'll be the better side. <laughs> All right. Thanks. You've heard the buzz about ketone supplements and how they can boost your workouts by helping your body use fatty acids for fuel. I take a shot of HVMN ketone supplement before my morning workout. It's focused energy. It's not an energy drink, though. It's like a feeling of being in the zone. I don't feel hyper jittery, anxiety, stuff like I get when I drink too much coffee. They're great for cycling, long runs, and all kinds of workouts, and can help you stay sharper 
on a regular basis. We also just received some exciting news. In addition to being available in select Equinox gyms, Ketone IQ can now be found in local Sprout stores nationwide. I wish I'd had this product when I was on active duty. I get better endurance, I don't get the crash, and it helps curb my appetite. HVMN is offering my audience 30% off your first subscription order of Ketone IQ. You can save 30% off your first subscription order of Ketone IQ at hvmn.com slash Sean. Again, visit hvmn.com slash Sean and subscribe upon checkout for 30% off. This show is sponsored by BetterHelp. Do you ever feel like your brain is getting in the way of living your best life? Like you know what you should do, you know what's good for you, but you just can't seem to do it? Therapy helps you figure out what's holding you back. That way your brain can work for you instead of against you. Therapy is a great way to learn positive coping skills and how to set boundaries. It empowers you to be the best version of you. And it's way more convenient with BetterHelp. It's entirely online and designed to be convenient, flexible, and suited to your schedule. Just fill out a brief questionnaire to get matched with a licensed therapist and switch therapists at any time for no additional charge. BetterHelp is truly the best way to make your brain your friend. Give it a try. Visit BetterHelp.com slash Sean today to get 10% off your first month. That's BetterHelp, H-E-L-P dot com slash Sean. Jen Sadley, welcome to the show. Thank you, Sean Ryan. Appreciate it. So we've had a very extensive conversation with your husband, and we just got through one of his many suicide attempts where you actually are the person that's that stopped that, that saved him. And so I'd like to hear your perspective of that day. Sure. Actually, yeah, let's go. Let's start with that day. We had known each other for a few weeks at this time, just kind of started dating-ish. Um, we were so work-focused um, and get it, got to know each other that way. And, you know, that day, he's normally, like, starts off rough in the morning. I think you probably talked about people don't talk to Tom before noon kind of thing. But this day was a little bit different. He stayed in that space throughout the entirety of the day. So um, not focused. He's so tight at work. I mean, this guy was flawless, what it seemed like, um, on targets. And he was missing things. He was messing up. So he just seemed like this isn't the normal Tom that I'm used to seeing. Did I think he was going to try to take his life? Of course not. I just noticed something was off. Something was different. And quite honestly, it was like 110 in Canton, Ohio. It was just, and we're smoked out with all of, they're all kitted up in all of their gear. So he said, I'm going to make a phone call. And I thought, in like 110 parking garage? Like this really is not adding up now. He's got a hotel room all to himself. Um, he could go in that room and make a phone call. Why is he hanging out in this parking garage? So I walked away from the car. I went with the other two Green Berets. And halfway to the room, they were helping me carry my photo gear. Um, the one guy had set it down, and he's like, hey, I'm just going to go shower real quick, and I'm just going to go down the bar right away. I'm not even going to wait for everyone. I'm just going to, you should just come down after. And I said, you know what, I'm going to try to get a hold of Tom, and then I'll just wait for him and come down with Tom. And he's like, okay, sure. Um, so I went to the room, and I started unpacking my gear and just, Everything inside my spirit was like, something's not right. So I started texting him, you want to meet me? You know, Teddy said he's going to go to the bar early. Let's just go early. Nothing. Hmm, he's usually very, very responsive. Another text, nothing. Another text, nothing. And by this point, I thought, he's not on a phone call. And I knew something was off. I was just about ready to go to the parking garage. And for some reason, I don't even know why. I told him he was late. He, he wasn't late. I mean, we had he hours. He wasn't late. No, we had hours before this meetup. And so I people ask me why I said that to him or how did I know? It was divine. I I know that now. That it took something like that to stop him. You guys had only known each other for a couple of weeks up to this point in time. Mm -hmm. 
You're busy as shit. You have a bunch <laughs> of camera gear. You're trying to manage an entire film project for what, the U.S. Navy? Mm-hmm. Yes. And this is what's on your mind. This is what's sticking. For sure. For sure. Humans first, always. Just some guy's yeah. got to make a phone call that you know him for a couple of weeks, and that's yeah. in your head. It was in this my head. This right. I had, um, I had suicide attempts when I was younger, 14, 15. Um, I don't know if it was something just, we joked that our trauma was attracted to each other, and I don't know if it was instinct. I, I'm assuming it was God stepped in and said, tell him he's late, because that's what stopped him. And people, you know, the hardest thing he's ever told me was, you're my savior. You saved me. And that broke me. He told you that. Mm -hmm. And I said, if I save you, I can also destroy you. Like, I'll miss it one time. You won't get that text from me that says you're late. And so there was this tremendous wait for years that I thought I could keep him alive. And I watched him bang guns off his head. I was on my knees begging him not to pull a trigger, literally thinking I'm gonna watch. How would that start? In the stupidest way possible, every single time. And that's what makes it feel so insanely crazy, is that this is over nothing. This is over a cup in the sink. This is over socks left on the staircase. This is something that has embarrassed you. Just this big of going, hey, you're overreacting. I'm overreacting now. You're telling me. Now I've embarrassed you, I've shamed you. But that's not the conversation we're having. It's still, you're a shitty mom or you're a shitty wife, you, you know, into the cycle of I am going to destroy you and I'm going to take you down to nothing. And then once he would do that, it would be this aha moment of what have I done? Complete shame, embarrassment, pain. And I think the worst part is I could see it. I could see it on his face that he was in so much pain what he just did to me. And so immediately I would go into repair mode. Don't worry about it, it's fine. We'll talk to a therapist tomorrow. Just get some air, just go for a drive, go punch a bag, call a friend, you know, because I knew he was this close many, many times. And there was a time where he had his finger on the trigger, just once. I mean, you would see him actually holding a pistol. To his head. Banging it on his head. In tears saying, let me just do this. How many times did that happen, do you think? Six, seven. I mean, I, I got to the point where I started hiding the gun as soon as I could feel something was off that day. And then that would piss him off. Where are my guns? Well, I don't think you should have them. You know, last week I saw you banging it on the side of your temple, asking me to give you permission to end it. I'm never going to do that. I'm never going to let you. I'm going to fight for you, fight for us until the end. And so I think the last time I literally was on my knees, we were in the bedroom, and he always told me, and I, I knew this for 10 years, you never put your finger on the trigger unless you intend to pull it. And so all these other times he had the gun in his hand, but this time he put his finger on the trigger. And as soon as I saw that, I thought it was done, truly. I thought I was going to watch him pull it. And I know many other unit wives that had to watch that. So I literally thought in that second, like, this is my time. This is where I watch him die. What stopped him? I fell to my knees, literally was grabbing him by his pants. Um, I knew not to try to take the gun. I was scared to touch it, that he might react. Um, and I think when he saw me fall to the ground, just sobbing, begging him not to, he, it's like this recollection, like Tom came back, because um, Tom's often gone when this would happen. He goes somewhere else. Crawler came forward, and the guy I knew and loved was gone, just gone. His eyes would turn black, and then they would turn blue again. And when I saw him see me on the ground that way, he, he fell to the ground too, put the gun to the side, and he said, I'll never do that to you again. And he didn't. That was it? That was it. Where are the kids when this is all happening? Thank God, never at our house. And truly, thank God. Um, for some reason, he wouldn't really start it when they were around. I think, I think he knew they're my, they're my hard line. 
they're not going to see that. They're not going to be put into a situation like I had growing up. And you'll be gone before they will be gone. So he was always very careful around my kids, always um, guarded, hands off, to the point where I'm like, you could come out of the bedroom at times. Like, you don't have to lock yourself away. But thank God none of that ever happened in front of them. But I know there are many military families that it does, many. What did it feel like? When did he tell you about that one day? In the parking It was garage. like a, it was this odd night. Like we were out probably drinking and he's like, Hey, you know, that night that you, you know, we went and sat because it was, was kind of like the first night we sat by ourselves, like isolated ourselves from the group. He came into the bar. I could tell he just was disheveled still. He didn't, didn't look right. And so I said, why don't we just go like sit in the corner? Cause it was loud and you know, we were working with a SEAL team. So we had the Green Berets that we were contracting with, all the SEALs were coming. Like, so it was starting to become really chaotic and full. <laughs> so like at that point, I'm like, we can go over there and nobody will notice. Mm -hmm. Like we've tucked away. Um, so that's what we did. And that night we really got to know each other. So it was a couple months later, he's like, you know that night when we tucked away? I'm like, yeah, you were off that day. He said, you saved my life that day. And I said, I did what? I mean, I kind of laughed, like, haha, I did what? He said, no, I sat there with a gun. And your text telling me I was late stopped me. And I don't know if I believed him at first. Like, it seemed too big. Like, it took me a minute to grasp that. And then it took me to a very, very scared place for many years. I didn't want to be a savior. I didn't want that pressure. Um, but I love this man so deeply. It, there's no way I was going to let go of him either. At dinner two nights ago, I guess mm -hmm. now, um, you had mentioned the first time that you met Tom, <laughs> who sounds like a complete disaster. And so I'd like you to, I'd like you to tell that story. Yeah, I actually called him a seal. <laughs> first time I, I could see how that would turn into a yes. disaster. <laughs> I um I knew very little about special operations. My dad served um, Air Force, but he was out before I was born. My brother left when I was 10 um, for military. So, of course, my family had a deep love and, and very patriotic, but I didn't know anything. Like My dad never talked about my brother, never talked about it. So when I was called up to do this job, I said, no, I don't. I don't want to do that. I'm working in fashion. I'm doing sports. I'm doing all this other stuff. I'm in commercial advertising. I'm fine. I don't need to go work with special operations, a bunch of like testosterone dudes that I don't even know what they do. And, and by the way, I've never held a gun in my life. Like, I, I don't know anything about this. You're going to do better. I even gave them names like, call this guy, call this guy, call this guy. Former Ranger was my client. So I was voluntold like, no, you're going to go on this one. And then you don't have to go back. Like you could move back on to another project. So I kind of didn't want to be there. I was like, uh, let's get this over with kind of thing. Uh, I was walking down the hall, and the, the guy who owned this company was a former unit member. And so he stops, like, really dramatically. And he said, have you ever seen Black Hawk Down? And I'm like, yeah, it's been a minute. Like, it was 2001, right? And he's like, yeah. Side note, my former place that I used to work at were all guys. I was the only female designer there, and Black Hawk Down had come out that year. So constantly on our big, big, big screen, like our movie theater size screen, where we'd show our commercials, it would play 24 seven. So like, I had this thing in me when he's like, do you know Black Hawk Down? I'm like, oh my God. yeah, I'm really well versed in it. Yeah, I know that movie, it's great. Um, used to have to tell them, can you turn it down? Cause the clients are hearing gunfire in the background and nobody's shooting guns here. So I kind of made a little joke like, yeah, I know it. And, you're about ready to go meet two of the guys that were in. I was like, oh my gosh, wow. My mind's like, Eric Bana was in that. Like I start thinking about all these really cute guys that were in, oh, okay, I'm gonna go meet some of the guys from Black Hawk Down. You know, and I said, he said, you know what Delta Force is, right? Because they, they, these guys were not in the Ranger group, but in the Delta group. And I go, yeah, that's like a Navy SEAL, right? And he stopped me and he goes, excuse me? And I go, <laughs> I go, what? They're like they're, they're like the army seals, right? And he said, we'll have a history lesson and I'll catch you up after this. 
He never did. But it was his way of telling me, like, you don't know what you're talking about. Better zip it. And I took his advice because for about three and a half years, I kept my lips zipped after that. Um, but I walked in the room and Tom's sitting there. And he's like way overweight, kind of ruddy red from drinking all the time. And <laughs> I looked down and I was like, oh, that's not Eric Bana or one of the other boys <laughs> from Black Hawk Down. And then I thought, wait, it's been like 10 years since that, 20 years since the actual event. Yeah, these guys are going to be older now. Um, and there was a haunted, so it was at a place where there was this haunted hotel and insane asylums in, in Indiana, ironically, where he was born is where we met. And I said, hey, like, let's go check out this haunted house. So this like unit guy, like he cares. And he's like, nah, it's okay. I'm like I'll hard pass that. And so I don't know, I didn't think much of him. He didn't think much of me, clearly. He didn't even know who I was. So it really wasn't until we started working on a few iterations where he actually started talking because he was super quiet at first. And I think he said his awesome first line was, I friended you on LinkedIn. Yeah, cool. Congratulations. <laughs> Congrat <laughs> I'm glad we're friends. <laughs> what was it about Tom that, that really got your attention? He was a bad boy be quite honestly. I mean, I had spent many years as a party girl, um, a lot of untreated trauma, I realize now, but I went into mom mode for a very long time and I was the total soccer mom and it felt inauthentic, I guess, in some ways, never about my children. I adore my children. I get a lot of shit for how much I adore my children. Um, but I think being raised in an abusive household, I overcompensated the other way. Um, but when I went out with Tom, I wasn't mom anymore. I was back to Jen and back to reckless party girl. And I had a lot of fun. Quite honestly, I had a lot of fun. I mean, this is almost contradictive of itself, <laughs> you know, because <clears throat> you fixed him. You're a big part of fixing him. So, but you're having fun being back in, oh yeah, in that in that mindset. So, so you had to sacrifice a lot because you're having fun to, to to get him better. So, what, at what point did you decide we both need to clean this shit up a little bit? Before our wedding, was it because of Tom that you decided? It yeah, was a good because thing? I lived this total crazy weird double life for a very, for the, I, I embedded for about three and a half years as combat camera on stateside missions. So for those three and a half years, I'd go away for two weeks, come back for two weeks, go away for four weeks, come back for a week, gone for two weeks, back for a week. So I was constantly moving to either a different team, a different RMT, different training cycle. And then I started to get why the guys wanted it and wanted to go back. Cause then that started to happen to me. I'd be home for three days and I'm like, all right, what, what teams got, you know, even if I wasn't assigned to that team, I would call my boss like, hey, you want combat camera? Yeah, I just I just got home. No, nope, put me on it. So you got addicted to it. I did, for sure. I ate the camaraderie, the embracing the suck, like, because it sucked. I mean, we're in warehouses with, I don't know, it feels like 150 degrees and you're there for 16 hours and everybody hates life and then you all have a great time and high five after. And it felt good to be part of something bigger. It felt good to be part of something that I felt like these guys are making a difference. And I'm super, super, super small part of it, but I'm part of it, of these guys going out and doing what nobody else wants to do, by the way. I spent my life as a creative. And at that point at 38, I'm like, I got to be a creative. I got to be an art director and a filmmaker instead of going off to war. Because I could have gone off to war and done none of these things. But I got to do my job because these men and women are doing the really shitty hard jobs. So I became super appreciative. All the Hollywood stuff, all the lies <laughs> that are told about you guys started unpeeling for me bit by bit by bit. And I'm like, they've got it so wrong. So wrong. These guys are humanitarians. <laughs> they're, they're meant to be treated like and talked about like they're monsters. Humanitarians. 
They're the best of the best and the strongest of the strongest. So I quickly wanted to be part of that tribe. I saw the love of the brotherhood, frankly, and I was brought into that just in a little bit. Um, it felt good. You had mentioned at dinner, <clears throat> it sounded like there was an exact moment where it all switched for you, and it was a Green Beret that said, you tell it. Oh, gosh, which one? The um, We're humanitarians. Oh, God, I love that. He really, so I didn't know the mission of the Green Berets. Like, oh, they're door kickers, right? Like, that's what they do. They go in, they're badasses, and they fight at war, and they come home. And when I started working with them, they're like, there's the chaplain, there's these people and these, and they started going through the different teams. And I'm like, what do you guys do? Like, what, what's your mission set? And he said, to, to free the oppressed. You know, we, we, we go in as nation builders, we were humanitarians. And I looked at him, I said, what? He's like, yeah, we build nations. We go in and we help the oppressed, we free them. That's our job. And I said, nobody's ever put it that way to me. You always hear fight for freedom, but no, no one had ever put it that way. We're the humanitarians going in, trying to stop the bad guys to build the new so that the good guys in that community can thrive. And that's what you guys do. Pretty cool. Pretty very cool, cool how it switched for you like that. Oh yeah, I became the biggest fangirl. I mean, the amount of respect and love that I developed for our warfighters and their families. I mean, it took me a while for families, so I spent three and a half years working with teams. But then I started, quite honestly, it came with a SEAL who said, can you talk to my wife? Here's her phone number. And it didn't go so well at first because she had a female calling saying, I'm calling about your husband. And it really threw her off. I don't do that anymore. I don't call spouses, you know, cold. But that's how it started. And I started talking to spouses who are like, I'm not getting the same guy. He's leaving for a deployment and pieces of him aren't coming back. And so when he's gone, not only am I praying for him to come home, but I'm praying for like all of him to come home. Let's talk about your wedding night. <clears throat> Tom doesn't remember much of it, but no. I'm sure you do. What um, happened? I, you know, I started down the same road as him, doing shots. Wasn't so smart. We were both stressed out. We get to the bar after, and um, a lot of work friends, right? So all the military element comes in. Not their fault. <laughs> they weren't shoving drinks down our throat. We did that. Um, but I, I think at that time still is very permissible. Like you're gonna drink, you're gonna be reckless, you're gonna have fun. And that's still the phase that we were in at that time. And so I think I looked over at Tom maybe on his fifth shot and I had stopped and I looked at him and I said, hey, like it's probably good for the night. That was not received well. Um, I think he kind of went the opposite. Like don't tell me to stop drinking. And so he started drinking more and more and more to the point where we ended up at a second like rooftop bar. We sit down and there's a band. I love to dance. Like that was always the joke with the guys because I'm like, ooh, put on some music. And, and so everybody, you know, these guys take me to this bar because they're like, oh, we'll get Jen dancing. You know, it'll be fun. And he sat down with um, the co-owner. We had a, started a a special operations training company. So the third party to that, he sat down with his wife and spent the entire night chatting with her in the corner. I felt completely betrayed, like small, invisible, um, like I made a mistake, quite frankly, because I thought this is gonna be our life. This train wreck right now <laughs> is gonna be my life. Um, so as we were walking back, I said, do you know you didn't even talk to me tonight, nonetheless dance with me, or kiss me or anything. You spent the entire night in the corner talking to her. Like, that's really weird, right? Oof. It just, it was full explosion. Because I think he realized in that moment, oh my God, you just embarrassed the crap out of me. Um, I'm ashamed. And so he literally was yelling at me so loud walking down the street in Savannah, I'm in a wedding dress. He's in his outfit. I still have my bouquet. So here people are like honking and waving. I have tears. We get into the hotel of the Hilton and the manager comes over because Tom's yelling at me so loud going up the escalator that he meets me to the other side and said, 
looked at me a mouth, do you want me to call security? And I said, no. He said, are you sure? And I said, yes. And he says, I have your room number, meaning I'll be listening. Um, no one's ever done that to me in my life. Said like, I'm watching out for you, a manager of a hotel. I became embarrassed, ashamed. Like what situation am I in? That somebody is stopping me saying, I'm here to help you from your husband. We got into the room. Um, there was a makeup case and things by, and he just started tossing them, just started throwing things across the room. In the back of my mind, I'm thinking of that manager too. Like, oh my gosh, that manager's gonna hear, he's gonna hear this, Shh, Tom, Tom, Tom. So I'm telling him to be quiet and don't worry about it. You know, he grabbed me a few times, threw me to the ground. And on the third time he had kind of thrown and pushed me, he pushed me hard to the point where I thought this could get dangerous. This could get deadly. He's, he's raging. He's full on in a space where I'm afraid of him now. So I locked myself in the bathroom. I didn't sleep all night. I sat up all night just thinking, if I leave him, he will pull the trigger. For sure. For sure. I cannot leave him. I can't leave him like this. And I can't stay. So what do I do exactly? And I didn't have an answer. I just waited till he woke up and kind of looked at me and I was holding the certificate and I said, I just don't know if we should turn this in. And it wasn't a threat. It wasn't like a, I'm gonna try to trick you into this. I legitimately thought I just made a big mistake. I have two small children. I can't bring you into my home like this. And so we sat on a beach for a few hours. <clears throat> he asked to hold my hand, I said, no. Um, he respected that. He said, can we talk? I said, no. So for about two and a half, three hours, we just sat there staring at the water. And I prayed. I asked God to fix this for me. And I wasn't a, I, I don't want to say I wasn't a believer because I was, I always believe in God, but I was not a practicing person in the spiritual way at all. But I felt a calmness come over me. I reached over and I grabbed his hand and I said, if you get help on Monday, I'll stay. But you have to get better or I have to go. You understand that, right? Like I have to go if you can't get better. It's not safe for me to be with you. It's not safe for my children to be with you. It's not safe for your child to be with you when you behave this way. And he said, I understand. And on Monday he had an appointment and I had hope. How long did it pass? How, long, how much time had passed before you saw him again? Three weeks. Three weeks. Three weeks. You got married, and then you didn't see your husband for three weeks. Yeah, it probably could have been longer. Um, he was offered to do part of our contracting elsewhere, and he decided that probably not a good idea. Decided to move to St. Louis at that point. So I flew out to Savannah, helped him pack his stuff. Um, he was going to come a few months later, but he said, I need to be with you now. I need to do this with you. How much improvement had you seen in three weeks? He was playing a good game for a while, but it was a game. He had not fully bought into this healing stuff yet. So I saw the Tom who was trying really hard, like what he thought healing looked like or to, to be healed looked like. He was reading books and quoting like, you know, the four agreements all the time. And I'm like, Hmm, maybe he is getting it. It's a great book, by it the way. It is a great book. <laughs> and quite honestly, people at work, he'd come in, he's like, you should not take things personally. And he would quote these things, and they're like, <laughs> who is this guy? Like, what? And they'd look at me like, you bro literally, I've had many people told me I broke him. I'm like, what, that he's like healing? And he's not a jerk all the time? If that's breaking him, then okay, I broke him. I made him do yoga. Yes, I did. <laughs> it's okay. He's still a badass. <clears throat> but it was about three years before I saw true change. Three years? Mm hmm What? How many things did he try in three years? Transcendental meditation. We did um, pharmaceutical supplementation, which helped him a lot. So getting all of his biology kind of right, that's where we focused first was I started reading everything that I could about PTSD. And I was like, okay, this is what PTSD is. And I remember calling him like, here's the checklist and they have 36 things on here and you have like 45, I added some. Like, you definitely have this. He's like, no, I don't. 
The Army didn't give me PTSD. And I said, what do you mean they didn't? I'm like, I I've seen Black Hawk Down. There's no way you came out of that okay. Like, there's just no way. And we had never really talked about Black Hawk Down just one time. He said, no, I only have like 10% disability. Kid you not. And he had nine surgeries. So um, we found a woman named Peggy through a friend, and he was requalified at like 220%. And he absolutely was checked with TBI and PTS. Um, understanding that diagnosis or how to tackle it gave us a starting place of, wait a minute, this reckless behavior, acting this way is part of it? I always thought I was a bad teen. Like, oh, I was just a bad kid. And then I'm like, wait, some of the same behavior these soldiers have was the same be behavior I had. Totally different set of trauma, totally different set of circumstances, behavior, very similar. So in healing him, I healed myself, for sure. When did you guys decide to... When did the idea of the All Secure Foundation start? It was two things, really. Um, I was on the last exercise I would do. It was four weeks. Um, it was with the SEAL team, and I didn't want to be gone that long anymore for my children. By this time, it had been almost three and a half years in, and I thought, what am I doing? Like, I need to be at home. Um, I want to be at home. So that exercise for me, um, as a mom, did it. I'm like, I, I can't keep going like this. Um, so family was a priority. And I thought, well, what am I going to do when I put my camera down and I'm done with this? And I told Tom, I said, you know what? We've helped all these guys go to war, like, but nobody's helping them come home. It's like what I keep hearing. And on that last iteration, um, two SEALs were killed previously. And so this team was the team that had come back. One of these guys is 28 years old. He looks 45 to me now. I saw him on an iteration a year and a half before. And I could just see it on all of their faces. It was so heavy. And so I asked one of the guys who I knew closer, I said, how are you doing? And he was, yeah, it's good. And I go, no, how are you? How are you doing? How are you grieving? And once I said that, he just looked at me and he said, we don't do that. I said, you don't grieve? No, there's no time for that. It broke my heart. It broke my heart. I know these men love these other men. And to have them say, we don't grieve? I talk about an unrealistic expectation of a human being. Um, their commander had become friends with Tom. We had done a few iterations, so I knew him as well. And I asked Tom, would it be out of place for me to call him? These guys are suffering. Nobody's doing anything for them on the teams. Even I had asked a few other guys, are you guys at least talking to each other? I get it, like the organization's not doing anything. Are you guys going out and getting a beer? Are you talking about it? That's not what we do. That's not what we do. That's what I kept hearing called the commander and I said, your guys are really, I'm just coming to you. Maybe out of place, I don't know. But I've talked to like four guys on your team and they're all really messed up about this and nobody's talking and nobody's helping them. He said, we have behavioral health, they know where to go. That was it. I told Tom, I said, this is unnatural, it's unnormal, this is not the way humans are supposed to survive. And, and nobody's training them. It's not that they need to know. It's not that they're broken. I hated that. Like, these guys are broken. Well, no shit. If you saw the things that they saw and did the things they did, which is completely incomprehensible, by the way, to most civilians. We have no idea. And by the way, the movies don't get it right most of the times. Some of them do. So I didn't go to combat, but I spent years and years training with them. And even the training cycles are completely traumatic and stressful. I, the very first one on a SEAL died by the truck um, rotating and flipping. And on day one, they're like, training's over. And I remember asking Tom, like, what happened? And he said, well, someone was killed. And I said, here? Oh, yeah, a vehicle rolled on my very first exercise. And I thought, I asked him, I said, God, how often do people die in training? He said, all the time. God, people have no idea. Um, so I said, listen, they're not broken. This is biological. This is a total biological. Because then I started learning about PTS, so I'd start telling all the guys on Target, like, hey, hey, go, go get natural pharmaceuticals. Start sleeping right, you know, do these things. Talk to a therapist. And really loved kind of that process of talking to them. And they're like, hey, can I call you when this exercise is over to see what Tom's doing next? Yeah, 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 here's my phone number. And then I would spend 11 hours a day on the phone. Just next dude, next dude. Can you talk to this guy on the next team? Yeah, 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 yeah. Um, try this, try that. Go to meditation, do this. And I said, 
we need to do this. We need to help train people on how to come home. And Tom's like, you mean a nonprofit? I'm like, yeah. He's like, it's, you're in marketing and a film girl. And I was in the unit, like, what do we know about nonprofits? And I'm like, everything's figure outable. We'll figure it out. Like, you just said it, you were in the unit. You did harder things. We'll figure this out. I mean, it took a few years, but we did. <clears throat> you have, you're like an encyclopedia of statistics <laughs> uh, when it comes to PTSD and, and all of this stuff, the suicides. Can you go through some of the sure. statistics that really resonate with you that you think will, will capture some attention? The first time I heard was on an exercise. Well, you know that there are 22 veterans a day that take their lives. And I said, no way. I argued with the guy. I said, there's no way 22 a day. I said, I would know about it. Like I'm plugged in now with this community. So my, you know, my boyfriend has PTS and everything. And, and I even knew he had suicide attempts. Not only that, as I started to get to know Tom's friends, I'm like, I know this is deeply personal, but this will really help me with like my research and what I want to do. Do you ever have suicidal ideations? Is it okay for me asking you that? Every single one of, every single one of Tom's friends said yes. Not a single one said no. And I was starting to hear not just once a day, but like a hundred times a day, I think about it. And so I started telling my civilian friends, do you ever hear this number, 22 veterans a day take their life? Every single civilian friend of mine had the same reaction. That's not true. That's too high. There's no way. We would know. We would know about that. So I called Mission 22. And their name is Mission 22. You got this 22 a day. Where did you get that number from? And they were very gracious. And they talked to me a lot as we were starting up our foundation. Well, this comes from VA statistics and numbers. So I started poking at the VA. And it's really, really difficult to get numbers. And for a number person who likes to have that line, I started realizing well, it depends on who you ask now. You know, I, just on TV recently, I heard 17 a day, which is grossly underestimated. So I started doing more research and I looking into that. And I looked at the VA piece from 2014 and they left out several states. And then I started asking for additional research and nobody had it. Even the organizations that Tom and, and others were in, do you have statistics on this? Do you have numbers on this? Do you know what's going on here? Nope, 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 nope. Well, just this last year, um, I talked to a man, Jim Lorraine, and, and we were chatting about the numbers, and he's like, well, it's actually 44 a day. And I said, what? 22 days, insane. It's over 8,000. Now you're telling me it could be up to 16,000 a year? A year. That's like, we went to war because of 9-11. There were over 2,600 people that died. So that would be like, I don't know, four or five 9-11s happening every year just to our veteran population? Every single year, that happening. If that were kindergarten teachers, people would be paying attention. But to say there's 16, up to 16,000 suicides a year? I don't know, I haven't seen a news report about it. I haven't heard people really talk about it. And I don't know why. People have asked me, why do you think it is? Is it the assumption there were fighters and this is the natural progression? Well, that's sick. You knew what you were signing up for at 18. No, you didn't. And by the way, even if you did, that means that it's okay for you to take your life because of the trauma that resulted in it. It makes no sense to me. It makes no sense. There's no, if there were one a day, it'd be too many. But 44 is, I don't know. How many veterans have killed themselves since 9-11? Up to, well, again, the numbers can be quite skewed. I've heard anywhere from 65 to 140,000. In the same amount of time, we've had roughly 6,000 deaths by killed in action. So the enemy, as you can see, they're not touching American warfighters. American warfighters are taking themselves out. They actually made a propaganda video about that. Did they? I saw it. Yep, yeah, came out. probably seven, eight years ago. They actually, they talk about it. <clears throat> I mean, I know you're the interviewer, but how does that make you feel when you learn that statistic? It, 
brings me to rage, but that's be that's probably because um, I mean, uh, Tom had described that earlier too. Sadness turns to rage. Anxiety turns to rage. Any any emotion mm-hmm. other than happiness, pretty much, just goes straight to rage. For sure. In resentment, and when I hear things like that, and I hear civilians don't know, they don't really care. Canadians are doing veteran-assisted suicide. Wouldn't surprise me if that comes into the U.S. I don't. I mean. I got my benefits from Peggy Matthews, too. I won't even step foot in a VA. After those initial, what do they call them, the, the exams right. that they give you, I think I went back one time, and uh, I never. I just don't think they have your best interest. We were there one time, too. We you left know? mid-appointment. Peggy even told me, don't ever, don't ever go in there. And... Um, I mean, it just, I don't feel like it's in the VA's best interest to keep us alive. It costs money. I agree. You see the staff that they hire. Shit. I mean, you go to the doctor. I remember I remember the time that I did go, I went to a doctor who barely spoke any English, and she was wearing sweat a, a sweatsuit, like sweatpants and a sweatshirt. And Showing I was like, up to you, you're, give her best. <clears throat> you're my doctor. <laughs> Didn't even know what a seal was. Didn't care. Didn't want to know, wanted to know why I didn't go to medical, you know, after the mission. And it's, it's, there is no medical lady, you know, and, and and you can't get your drugs prescribed anywhere else. They feed you the drugs that you don't need, you know, and it's, it's like, okay, so you want me to die. You're going to over prescribe me with painkillers, benzos. Whatever sleeping pills, whatever you can get your hands on, for sure. Give them to me. Get me addicted. And, and then later. Yep. See you later. I mean, so essentially, we're already doing veteran-assisted suicide right here at the VA because that's what they do is pump you full of drugs. Maybe it's gotten better. That was, I mean, that was. Get it's getting close to ten years, you know. So maybe there's been some improvement. I don't know. We walked out of the only one we went into. Tom was on 14 pills and doing nothing for him except for everything wrong. And then I started Googling and I'm like, why are you, how long have you been taking this pill? And he was like, 14 years. I go, oh, it says on here for short term six month usage. And he's like, what? And I showed it to him and I'm like, we got to get you off these pills. And we go to the appointment. I tell the doctor, first of all, I said, well, he was in the unit where the amount of cancer and, and rare diseases coming out of there is relevant information to a doctor. And I said, he served in the unit. He goes, I don't see how that's relevant. I don't see why that matters. I'm like, he spent 20 years in combat, filthy places, training in places with asbestos, all kinds of things. How do you not find that relevant? And then I look down and he starts writing a script right after we said, we want to get him off these pills. He said, here's two more. <laughs> You could pull this one off and take these two. Then I go, stand up. And Tom stood up and we just turned and walked out. I'm like, we're leaving. Never went back. And he got off all 14 pills. Became much clearer, much better after he did. For sure. It, <clears throat> it enrages me and I, I, I don't go there for very often, you know, because you. of that. But, um, and it's, it's, I mean, I found other ways, you know, Peggy Matthews, my doctor, um, psychedelics. For sure. Therapy. I just started finding other ways to treat myself rather than than the... the But you took it upon yourself and you took the effort and you made it. And I think that's what's so necessary is that And the part with Tom saying that you saved me, I'm like, I wish I had that power. Because then I'd just go around and save everyone. I'd be like, Jesus, like, all right, I'm going to walk on some water. Everybody's good. I don't have that power. There's already been a Messiah. All I can do is say there's a better life than the one you're living right now. I mean, I think a lot of guys find, I think, I don't know how to say this, but I think myself included, it takes 
For me, it took seeing how many lives I destroyed that loved me. Mm -hmm. uh, everybody around me, I destroyed every relationship around me. My family, ex-relationships, uh, friends, you know, and, and I saw... I saw the eggshell syndrome without knowing what eggshell syndrome is, uh, which you guys were talking about the other night. And um, it, it, you just realize you're a monster. I mean, just beating the shit out of people with bars for no reason. I mean, it just got to be, it, it's, it's humiliating. It's humiliating. And you don't realize how abnormal that shit is until you leave until you leave the the unit or the team or that that culture because that I'll probably get a lot of shit for saying this, but that's the culture. You know, you show up, you get you <laughs> work hard, you play hard, yep. you play at least as hard as you work. For sure. And what are you immersed in? You're immersed in violence, womanizing, booze. And and, and and rewarded drugs. for it. Yep. You get a medal for it. You get a lot of pats on the back when you bring the girl home. Yeah. And a lot of eye raised eyebrows if you don't. If you're not drinking. If you're not bringing someone home. If you're not playing that warrior reckless lifestyle, then something's wrong with you. So yeah, I mean, I the team doesn't trust you if you don't drink. One hundred percent. We just had a retreat. I had four active duty Green Berets. Each of them opened up on the very last day because one of them said. So glad that this was not like an alcohol-infused weekend. Thank you for not bringing alcohol. Now, Tom and I in the organization won't say, okay, we're done at 7. We're not babysitting you. We're not going to go to your room and don't drink. But we encourage people, like, do something different. If it's not working for you, do something different this trip. And when they come to our dinners, there's no alcohol. And, and so he said, you know, normally, even though I don't drink and I'm trying, trying this sober thing, I get so much shit from my teammates for not drinking that I end up drinking just to shut them up. And he's like, I'm really trying to be sober. The three other dudes at that table all did the me too, me too, me too. And I was so grateful they had that moment together because that's leadership. I can go back now and say, I'll go to the bar with you, but I'm gonna drink a water. No big deal, man. No big deal. You know, misery loves company. And you got a bunch of miserable people. They're all going to try to tear the tower down next to them, even though there's love there. I get it. I mean, people have asked me, why were you able to forgive Tom so quickly for his infidelity? And I said, because I saw the culture he was raised in from the time he was 19 years old. And he stayed there till he was 46. I saw how he was raised. And how he was raised was, it's normal to drink and drink it all. It's normal to womanize. Get them all. I, I saw it on trips. I saw it on iterations, like three and a half years of that. I got it. So I was able to forgive him saying, I got it, but that shit's not going to happen again. That's done. That part of the warrior lifestyle is not coming into this marriage because I'll end it. That'll be it. In fact, when he proposed, I'm like, I don't know if I want to be a wife. I just don't know. I see how a lot of guys talk about the wives. Why would I want to be that? What did he say? It'll be different with us. <laughs> How long did it take for it to be different? About five years. A lot of, I only threatened him once that I would leave him. And that was our wedding, the, the day after our wedding. I never threatened that I would leave him again. I didn't want to leave him. I loved him intensely. I still love him intensely. But the demons that had gotten really big became really scary and really dangerous. And so there were moments of, I'm not going to leave you, but we're going to get separate apartments. <laughs> you're going to move out for a minute so that I can remain safe while you're healing. And I think the frying pan came to, I'm going to get an apartment. I'm just going to leave. And I'm like, here's your keys. You want me to help you pack? He was like, oh, shit. <laughs> this is real. I'm like, yeah, this is real. Not just because I wanted a better life that I felt I deserved, but because I knew I, I, when Tom was good, he was so good. When we were good, we were great. And all the good moments, because people would say, why did you say? I'm like, because our good is so good. Our good is so great. It's amazing. It's the best I've ever had. We are each other's best friends. And I've got his back. And that meant good times and bad. 
And there was plenty of bad. I never threatened that I'd leave him, though. <clears throat> but he knew there were moments where, like, it, it was close. And he was miserable. He, was, he doesn't want to live that way either. He just didn't know how to get out of it. And he thought, I'm stuck this way forever. I guess I'm just broken this way forever, and it's not true. What was your biggest fear after that wedding night? What was your biggest fear? I, quite honestly, was afraid he would hurt me unintentionally in a way that it would shame him so much that he would take his life, that it would be a situation that we know happens. A war fighter hurts their spouse um, and hurts themselves. And, and it's more common than you think. It's a leading cause of suicide in veteran community is after a family disturbance, they take their life. Is it really? I didn't know that. It's the highest percentage by far, by far, is after a family disturbance, 90% alcohol or pills are involved as well. So that tells me war fighters don't want to take their life. If you have to be so drunk or so high to do it, I've talked to you, I don't know how many now, hundreds of guys. I've heard all of their stories, each one unique, each one painful, each one different, but the similarity is none of them wanted to do it. They just felt like I'm a monster. I'm ruining my family's life. My kids hate me. They're afraid of me. Maybe I put my hands on them, um, maybe not. Maybe it's just that I've isolated so much that they're all done with me. Now I'm not a war fighter, I have no purpose. My family hates me, bye. But it's gonna take a fifth of Jack to get me there. Tell me about, so you guys started about this nonprofit, the All Secure Foundation. How did you decide what you were gonna focus on? It was really tough, because at first I was so excited and I started using, so the last iteration I had gone on, and then there was one more exercise where I was in combat camera, but Tom was on, it was with PJs. And so I said, can I come fly out and just watch the exercise, talk to the boys? He's like, yeah, come on out. So I went out and I just used that as basically my research time. And what I started to find out was I just started asking the guys, do you need help with fitness? Do you need help with mental health? Do you need help in giving them all the PTS boxes? And what happened is the last SEAL iteration and the last PJ iteration, nine out of 10 guys said, I'm a terrible husband. I'm a terrible father. I don't know how to put the monster back in the box. That's what I need help with. Nine out of 10 said, I want to be a better person at home. So I said, that's where we need to focus. Um, and then really kind of what capped it off was we ended up helping a warfighter get into Warrior's Heart. Um, that's an organization that helps people with PTS and TBI but you also need to be either a warfighter or law enforcement. So it's very specific to the community. Helped get him fully funded, paid for. He's in the facility. Tom and I are feeling really good about it. He's a friend of ours, he's getting sober. But about two weeks in, I'm like, who's checking on his wife and kids? How long is he gonna be in this program? 14 weeks? I'm like, 14 weeks? How's he leaving his job? How's he providing for his family? Like, he's a contractor. Are they okay? Nobody knew, nobody knew. Um, none of his friends, and I wasn't really good friends with his family, but I ended up finding her on Facebook, and I reached out, how are you doing? She's, I am terrible. I am in the worst spot of my entire life ever. My husband's cleaning up, and I just found out about the affairs, about the money gone. He's, he, he's feeling great. I feel like shit, and nobody's helping me. Nobody's helping me and the kids. So I'm out here alone. After 25 years of deployments, he's gonna go get better, and I'm stuck here again. And that was the moment I said, no, 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 we don't focus on the warfighter. We focus on the warfighter and their spouse. And then eventually we'll get to the kids when we can figure out HIPAA, but we got to start with both. And so at our organization today, if a spouse, a divorcee, um, Gold Star, anyone calls us and says, my warfighter's not here, they're not willing to get help, they don't want to get help, whatever it may be, fine, come on. This organization is equally built for you. How long did it take for you guys to put all these things in place? I mean, that's a, you've got to narrow down to the family, <laughs> you know, so now what? So we started with um, the therapist that Tom and I had worked with. She had never worked with military before. She got us. She got us quick. Um, we probably wouldn't be married without her, quite honestly. Um, so one day she had said something to us. Um, she had done an exercise with Tom and she asked him to take the anger and remove it from himself. 
And I could see he was like, oh, great. We're going into this like really woo woo therapy thing. I could almost see an eye roll. And she's like, can you take the angry part of you and put it in the chair next to you? He's like shifting like, okay. And then she started asking him to describe the anger. What does it look like? And he described crawler. He described his call sign, fully kitted out. Then I could see it was starting to work. And she's like, what do you have to say to him? If he's the anger, if he's bringing the rage into the house, what do you want to say to him? And I'm kind of waiting for a smart ass, typical Tom answer. But then I could see that he was actually doing what the therapist said. He was doing his best and trying to visualize this. And he got really teary eyed. And he just said, I don't need you anymore. Thank you for keeping me alive over there. Thank you for helping me bring my brothers home. I don't need you anymore. I got it. And the way it changed for us at home after that is that I could start using the language of crawler. And we agreed in the therapy room I would never use that, hey, you being an asshole crawler. You know, I've never, ever used crawler. I love crawler. I respect crawler. Crawler is needed in this world. He's just not needed in my kitchen. He's just not needed dealing with the kids. So it's always out of respect. But when I would see him get big, get red, get rage, I would have a language, a point of stopping that saying, I don't need crawler to go tell the kids to clean the room. You don't need crawler to go on a date with me tonight. I want Tom back. And at first it was a screw that and that's not working, you know, resistance to that change. I would say two weeks in really quick when I said it again, it's kind of getting intense here. Crawler showed back up. Screw that, doors are slamming. He comes out two minutes later out of the room. Not two hours, not two days. Two minutes, and he's like, you're right, but I can't put him back in the box. I said, that's okay. We've identified it. What do you need to do? He said, I need to go for a drive for a while. Bye. Come back in an hour or 10. I don't care. It's fine. You know, this biological response that you had to 20 years of living a really difficult, I mean, that's putting it mildly, right? Intense life is going to have an effect on you. That's normal. That's the normal part is that it affects you. Scary if it doesn't. So you got the therapist in. Yeah, so sorry, we got the therapist in. This was in 16. We became a 501C3 in 17 official, and we started with coaching. So let's just get the guys in. We'll get them to Stacy. They can help these couples in the way that we've been helped. That was That's the goal. Um, right now, we just brought in our fifth. So we have five licensed clinical social workers that are all coaches. Um, and we do programs. So we have a marriage retreat that we absolutely love. We take 10 to 14 couples at a time, and they could, we cross them. So we'll have a SEAL, a Green Beret, MARSOC, PJ, um, NCOs, officers. And we tell people on day one, nobody gives a shit about what you did. Don't talk about it unless it comes up later and you're hanging out. But this room is for war fighters, no matter where you served or how you served or how long you served. We're here to deal with the shit afterwards, how it made you feel. And we're gonna work on it as a couple. We're gonna do this together. That's your forever battle buddy, by the way. Let me introduce you to her. The one that's been sitting there for 25 years, holding down the fort. It's her time to heal now too. It's gonna take her a little time. She's used to a different version. What do you? Th what is the response like? I mean, I don't think I wasn't married when I was in. And um, does it hit them? Do they know? Like, shit, I didn't think about that. We had a unit guy show up to one of our retreats, and he's one of our big volunteers now. He didn't believe he had PTS when he showed up on Friday. He said, I'm here because Tom was my boss. And you guys were looking for people to fill the retreat. And I thought, quite honestly, it'd be a good weekend to see Tom. I haven't seen him in a few years. He came on our retreat. He didn't talk the entire time. Some people will share, hey, this is happening at home. And then you get, yeah, me too, me too, me too. We see a lot of elbows flying, which is a beautiful thing because it's the first time most of these couples realize I'm not alone. This happens more often than I even imagine. I'm not crazy. There's a way to the other side of this. We can make it through. But this guy had said, I operated at the highest level for a very long time. And to me, PTS was the veteran under the bridge or an alcoholic. I don't drink. I don't have a problem drinking. I don't have a problem with rage. Well, his problem was isolating. His problem was not being present. So some people will look at PTS and they'll say, well, I don't rage. 
or I'm not an alcoholic, so I don't have it. But then when we started going through the other symptoms and other things, the anxiety, the depression, the loss of joy, the things that can show up, he identified with those pieces. So on Sunday, he raised his hand and he said, I have PTS. I didn't realize it. But now that I know, now I know how to fight this demon. He sent his wife home when he got home. It's one of my favorite stories. He said, I knew I had to clean up my life and I had to get rid of certain people and certain things. And it was going to make me an asshole why I did it. I was going to clean up my diet. I was going to get rid of processed fruits. I was going to do the supplements that you guys talked about. But I just had learned about eggshell syndrome and what I'd been putting my other two wives through. So much so that he gave his ex-wife my book. Just as a, sorry, sorry I did this to you. She wrote our organization. She didn't even write him back and said that it was really powerful to get that from him in recognition finally after 20 years of what was happening inside the home. So people absolutely wake up to, it's not relegated to the vet under the bridge or the alcoholic or the pill popper. It could be many different forms and it can come in many different ways. It's biological, it's not your fault. If you broke your arm in Iraq, there's a process for it. They would treat it. It's the same thing, you see a big traumatic event, the sooner you deal with it, the sooner you triage it, the better. So that's why Tom and I go and speak at bases. We talk to these guys that are brand, not even Green Berets yet, they're in the Q course. They look like my son's age, it freaks me out, quite honestly. I'm like, I'm calling your mom, does she know she, you're here? But we talk about, listen, when you go to war, this is the reality of it. This is what you can feel when you come back, kind of like that psychiatrist did with Tom. You might experience these things. And we see a lot of guys on their phones or ignoring us, like oh, this old couple talking about. But my hope is that that day when they're raging and they're feeling like I'm so broken, what's wrong with me? They'll say, Tom talked about that. Wait, this is normal. I, I could go get help for this and I'll be better. Because that's the truth. How many couples have you guys helped so far? Last count, it was over 1,500. But 1,500? That's, that's couples. We also do individuals. So if there's a warfighter listening in special operations, he's not in a couple or divorcing or divorced, our organization's for you as well. So um, individually, we've probably helped well over 5,000. 5,000 people. The funny thing is once you get to work and people find out who you are, we made it super, super easy. Connect with the coach button on our website. Boop. Within 24 hours, they're talking to somebody. We're not waiting four months. You're not waiting six months. Quite honestly, when somebody hits that button for help, we know we have a short window to get them. We know we do. Usually it's 11 o'clock at night when we get those messages, those reach out for help. We want to get them right away and say, we got you. And we don't do it all at All Secure. We, we specialize in couples, emotionally focused therapy. That's what we focus on. But we're connected to all of these other amazing nonprofits. So somebody comes forward and says, I want the SGB shot, or I want to do psychedelics, or can I get some information about traumatic brain injury? We want to be their partner, their triage partner. Okay, what is the thing? Where are you bleeding out first? My relationship, alcohol, pills, whatever it may be. Then we know, okay, have you looked into these options first? Have you looked into psychedelics? Have you looked into SGB? Have you, why don't you talk to our coaches first and look at an assessment with them? You'd be amazed how many people will come through our system. They do five sessions with us and they're like, got it. Nobody's training them. You guys are incredibly gifted, smart, talented leaders. Just need to be told what direction to go. That's it. Man, that's amazing. Simpler really than we make is. it. How long have you guys been around as a nonprofit? Since 17, since 2017 officially. It's so only six years. Mm -hmm. 5,000 something people in six years. Yeah. Maybe more. Congratulations. <laughs> Thanks. <clears throat> what do you guys need? Do you need, what do you need? Money? More therapy? Well, we can always use money. Quite honestly, we have an admin donor, which I'm really, I'm super proud of this company. They kind of wish to remain anonymous. I might get them to peek their heads out. Um, they're a really good Missouri family. They're our admin partner. So they cover our salaries, admin, all of that stuff. They're our business partner. Running a nonprofit is a business. Um, we have staff, we have people that work for us. 
They help us to cover those costs so that when people donate to our organization, 100% of that is gonna to go to a coach or to one of our programs. So it's going directly to a warfighter family. We always need more money because our therapists and our coaches are expensive. We cover those costs, the veteran doesn't pay anything. So we always need more money. With more money, more therapists, more development of new project um, programs. The program I'm super passionate about is getting our teens in. Um, I don't think many people know, but Children of combat warriors who have PTS are twice as likely, at least, um, to take their own life. Twice so, as likely? I've heard, the statistics are so tough, um, but I know twice for spouses as well. So for a spouse who's married to a combat warrior who has PTS, she's twice as likely to take her life as well. I think the Pentagon gave a whole 200 deaths on 2019 to spouses, but we know that number is far, far greater. We've actually been touched by families of Tom. Tom knows these men whose sons have taken their lives with their guns. Do you guys reach out to the SEAL teams, the unit, the groups? What are they, what is the response? Do they hide There's it? two responses that we get. If we get a good leader, we get a great response. Hey, can we show up? Can we come talk to your boys? Yeah. Let's look at the calendar. Let's look at the schedule. Let's see what we can do. Donovan and Bank is making a ton. They're a nonprofit, uh, former Green Berets. They're making a ton of connections. They were in, they were just recently out. So they're all over the place. And I, I'll check in with them on how leadership's taking it. We've seen both. I mean, I literally had a general told me I was full of shit because he didn't like my numbers. He didn't think they were accurate. Um, so I asked him for his numbers, you know, because basically what we, we come forward is, listen, your relationship is critical. It's life-saving, actually. I think one of the hardest things Tom told to a SEAL, he went through the Navy SEAL Foundation and spoke to one of the teams, and he said, how many of you guys would run out onto the battlefield and take a bullet for your friend? Of course, all, I mean, I think they were seeing a CAD guy show up, so they had to expand the rooms, and it was just huge. I think they were coming in for war stories, and he didn't give them any. I think there's probably a few disappointed guys in the room. But he's like, how many of you would do that? Every hand, you're looking across. Oh my gosh, all these seals. Yes, 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 me, of course. And he said, how many of you are going to take a key from a guy when you know he's drank the bar down? You're going to take the key away from him at night in that bar? Who's going to do that? Quiet. When he's picking up that girl, you know he's got a wife and two kids at home. And when that wife finds out she's going to leave him, that's loading a gun for that dude. We know statistically 89% are gonna take their life after something happens at home, divorce, an embarrassing thing. So you're willing to die for them overseas, but you won't help them at home. How's this making any sense? Like, how are we having each other's back? That's either received really well or not well at all. Depends how healed you are. So when I approached this general and I said, I need the divorce statistics, from you guys in special operations, knowing that if 89% are taking their lives after a family incident, how many divorces? How's divorce playing with war? We don't have those numbers. Yet the highest rate is after a family incident and you're not even, you're putting your money and your time and your effort over here when that's 4%. It makes no sense. And so research and numbers are critical because it helps Here's where the money needs to go. Here's where the attention needs to go. This general stepped out on his own after probably he was embarrassed that on Friday night he had to have his CSM call me and say, we don't have numbers on divorce statistics and special operations. I said, might be a good time to go get those, seeing how the numbers line up. They went and did their own research. One of the guys on her retreat this year said, guess what that general did research on family after you were there. I'm like, Amazing, what did they find? 39% of suicides happen after a family disagreement, 4% for all other. Wow. He goes, you are right. I go, it's not my numbers, it's their numbers. I'm just bringing them to you guys to say, pay attention, put your money and your time and your effort over here. No longer can you go to war and say the family's fine. It's not, they have to face the facts and whether they will or not, I guess it's up to leadership. Do you feel like the majority are taking it seriously? No, I do. I, I, I've heard some guys come up with some pretty stupid excuses. 
And they're the ones that are super unhealed and super in a bad place. I meant the commands. Um, I have seen some... Pro- so in 2013 is when I first met Tom and worked with Tom. 2023 to then is drastically different. I don't have to educate people on PTS anymore. I used to have to go on, this is the amygdala and this is the hippocampus and the bar. This is fight, flight, or freeze. I used to have to literally explain what PTS was when I'd go in to do my briefings. I don't do that anymore. People get it. We've dropped the D in our organization, post-traumatic stress injury. Um, We don't identify it as a disorder. You can heal from it. It's not a life sentence. It's a biological injury. I think they're getting that. What I don't think they want to spend their time on and money and effort is on the families, no. They want to train. They want to buy Gucci gear. They want the equipment. We still see that, yes. In fact, we just asked a company, um, where's your POTIF funds? And they were zero. We don't have any. And what's that? And who's that? And preservation of the force and family. And no, we don't know what that is. Tom goes, what's your training budget? Two million for this. Okay, so... All your money is going to your guns. None of it's going to the thing that's going to end up killing you. Damn. That's pretty sad. And hopefully something will be done about it. That's why yeah. we're here. Well, I'm sure a lot of them are listening. You know? I hope. <laughs> but uh, you guys better start making moves if you are listening. You know, I hear... You hear officers all the time and senior enlisted, oh, we don't want to do this op. We might lose somebody. We might lose somebody. I don't want to lose somebody. I don't. Well, you're f-ing losing people left and right. So get off your ass, put your f-ing ego aside, and do something. You're the only f-ing ones in a position to do something. So do it. Truly. This shit makes my hair stand up. I get so angry thinking about it. But, um... <clears throat> Well, Jen, what did we not cover? God, spiritual. We'll get to that. Okay. We'll get to that. But um, <laughs> I think for the organization, I mean, you asked what we need. We always need money. With more money, we have more programs, more coaches, more people we can help. And then the awareness of your show, quite honestly. It's been awesome. Even just the little Instagram, we had a lot of connect with the coaches last night. That's our goal is to get folks from the community to hit that button. Good. Yeah. Good. What, I do have one other question. Where all are your guys' retreats? Are they always at the same locations? Or? We have done them. Johnny Morris at Bass Pro Shop. He's a huge supporter of ours. We love Johnny. Uh, we started our retreats, did them every year at uh, Big Cedar Lodge out in Branson, Missouri. We are looking to develop our own camp home front, um, maybe in Montana, somewhere in the mountains. Uh, that's in development right now. But what we're doing in October, um, looking to build in Nashville and then do a West Coast, um, maybe out by the Seals, is to bring the information to them. That's immediate, like almost triage. So we're taking 150 versus 24, and we're bringing in speakers um, over a two-day event for couples, individuals in in the special operations community. We have some phenomenal speakers standing up and and sharing how they made it through, operators, field experts, couples saying, yeah, I struggled here and this is how I got through. And because it's so different for every person, we wanna hear multiple perspectives. We wanna hear from a SEAL how he started sleeping again and how that changed his life. I wanna hear from a Green Beret who had done psychedelics and how that helped him find God. We need to bring in so many different perspectives and we could do that over these two days. And at the end of the day, our goal is for that couple Every couple that's there is to say, this is my forever battle buddy. I got your six. You got mine. Good. No more of this worst wife, first wife, depend upon a miss. No more of this toxic culture in marriages can exist because it's killing them. It's killing you guys. Man, you guys are making a lot of waves. <laughs> it's awesome. Congratulations. Thanks. And, um, Jen, I just, it was an honor to have you here and, and thank Thanks. you for sharing all that. I know it's, some of that was probably not easy to right. to get off your chest, but um, thank you. And thank uh, you. a lot of good's gonna come your way when this releases. I know it will. So mm-hmm. we got an awesome audience. These people care. Incredible audience. So, I really appreciate you having us on. I know it'll make a big, big difference for a lot, a lot of people. My pleasure. All right, let's take a break.
The Jihadi Manifesto was recorded right before his December suicide bombing, which killed seven CIA employees and a Jordanian agent at this base in eastern Afghanistan. So everybody wasn't supposed to be outside there. It was just supposed to be the GRS team to meet him. Uh, Darren and the Jordanian uh, officer were supposed to be there. And that's it. That was a last minute thing there. Everybody comes out to, to form a greeting line. And unfortunately that gets a lot of people killed that wouldn't have otherwise been dead today. We will get you CIA team. Inshallah we will get you down. And he boastfully showed off the trigger or the bomb strapped to his body. Look, well, this is for you. It's not watch, it's a detonator to kill as much as I can. Unbeknownst to them, there's like, let's go out and form this meet and greet line. Uh, I don't know if you know this. I mean, we worked at the same department over at CIA. All right, Tom, I promise this is the last segment. <laughs> <laughs> I got to follow my wife. That's hard. You ready? I'm ready. All right. So talking to your wife and you after, after Jen was just on here, I didn't realize that All Secure Foundation is helping. It's not just veterans. It's active guys. Sounds like there's a lot of active duty guys. And so we had talked about how None of the information gets out. You guys don't keep records. I, w I, w I think it's really important that you elaborate on that because we've got a lot of active guys that watch this show, you know, and so they need to know that their information is safe. It's not going to get out. And so I, I just want you to go into that for a minute. Yeah, that's one of the biggest worries. And that was one of the biggest worries that I had and other people had. If I open up, the command won't trust me. There's something wrong with me. The psychs will say something. I'll lose my clearance. I'll get pulled. I'll lose my job. We say, that's bullshit. That's bullshit. Your commands are here to help you because the commands be like, we're here to help them. We're here to take care of them. We're here for them. And we believe them. And then we start hearing from command and some other mid-level leaders like, you need to self-assess. You can't get a DUI and then say I have post-traumatic stress. I can't help you then. You have to self-assess pre, you know, before you do something horrible and negative. A lot of these guys won't come and get help. So they won't reach out. They're afraid we're going to talk to their command. So they don't go to their shrinks. They don't go to local shrinks because they keep records. So we have coaches. And our coaches are not required to hand out or maintain any records. And I've been approached by two or three different organizations from people who are going through, like, drying out, you know, camps or, or checking into other hospitals. And they've requested paperwork. And absolutely won't hand it to them, and we don't legally. We are not bound to hand them any information because we don't provide counseling. We provide coaching, and so your records are safe. Your name is safe. You hit connect with the coach button on our website, and it goes straight to Genri, and then it goes directly to a coach who won't give out your information. And Genri would never get out of anybody's information. So the active duty has started flowing in more with that trust. And I hope that word of mouth goes out that, hey, you can be trusted. They can be trusted not to tell anybody and they're not sharing your stories and names around the world. And people have started reaching out more that way, knowing that they can trust us not to share who, who's asking. Are a you lot guys, of spouses are actually reaching out, too, because their husband's like, don't reach out because they'll ask and then they'll talk about me and then they'll know about me. So they know as well. I, are you guys the only ones reaching the act of duty? I've not heard of anybody else. I don't know. Um, I would hope not. I would hope we weren't the only ones. I think maybe active duty, some people feel is relegated to active counseling, active counselors. Um, I think other organizations offer help, but there's a real fine line between if you're active, what help you can go get. So people are seeking it on their own behind the scenes, you know, and possibly doing illegal things in order to get their own help. That's how difficult it is when active team guys and special ops guys have to go behind the scenes and do psychedelics or, or do other treatments because they know they need help. That tells me their organizations are not helping them. Very true. 
So we think we, when we spoke at Congress, we talked to some staffers and they were talking about how you're talking about the VA. You're trying to approve, get this thing approved for the VA biomarkers where they could determine through biomarkers who has post-traumatic stress because they were worried about some people are faking it, you know, and that's money, right? That's money to someone faking it. And then others who won't claim it. So, okay, you can get a, you can take a blood draw, find these biomarkers that'll tell you you have post-traumatic stress. So we went and spoke about post-traumatic stress, how it affected our lives. Both of us spoke. And they ended up passing that maybe two and a half years later. They got that bill passed. Well, just recently. That's awesome. And while we were up there, it's all VA, it's all VA. The staffer said, we want to take you to our congressman, who's now dead, but we want to take you to our, con our congressman, and we want this in the DOD as well. And it made sense. If you take care of them while they're in, it won't be as bad when you get out. We've always been preaching it, so we were happy when they said the DOD wanted to pick it up. I doubt that happened. Um, but the VA got what they needed out of it, and we started determining that helping active duty, keeping them stronger while they're in, helping them stay healthy, will give them a healthier family relationship at home, which will give them a better team time. Their people can trust them. They can hopefully spread that to the team, the positivity versus the negativity. And then when they do get out, that transition's a bit easier. They've already had that connection with mental health. They, they don't feel embarrassed to reach out. And then they continue to reach out and they continue to heal. So it's not like we're starting at ground zero 10 to 15 or 13 or even hopefully two years after retirement when they've hit rock bottom. Hopefully they know the process and they'll step right into it easier. Man, that's amazing. <clears throat> There's something I want to talk to you about, and it's it's – it's getting better, and um, it's 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 for the operators that are getting better, and 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 I feel like that there is more to this than trauma. Too, I think that there's a big sense of self worth that is lost, sense of purpose that is lost, and I think that a lot of the guys that are coming up from the coming out of these you know tip of the spear units, it's really hard to reinvent yourself would you agree with that a hundred percent and yeah it, i know i struggled with that a lot i know a lot of guys struggle with that it's that i mean you come in a, it's like being a pro a pro athlete and then it's gone now what the hell do you do and so how did setting up the all secure foundation help you with all of that the giving back, the helping, the teaching, because we don't help. I, I use the word help. I didn't want help. These operators don't want help. So we use the word teaching. Come learn a new skill or come get retrained on your old skill that you've had before. You've lost those talents. You replaced them with other talents, violent ones. So we don't like to say help anymore, but come get training. And it was, the question was... I'm sorry, maybe I worded that wrong. I'm not asking what All Secure Foundation does for these guys. Mm -hmm. I'm asking, and it could be anything. It could You could replace the All Secure Foundation with something else that maybe you would have, that you did. But it seems like that's the most significant thing that you've done since you've left. And it's very significant. And so what I'm asking is finding that new sense of purpose and knowing how important the mission actually is. Have you seen more improvement just in that alone, just in the new sense of purpose, the new, your new life's purpose. I mean, how has that helped you? My new tribe. Your new tribe. Right, my new family, my new thing, um, a reason to live, hope. Not just sitting there wondering what I've been, but how will I be better now? Instead of sitting in my misery, thinking of all the things I did, you know, that last high school touchdown pass I threw. Did I peak in high school? Am I gonna live that the rest of my life? So I, I can't, you know, I did something pretty good. I thought it was great. It was amazing. I left it, you know, a little bit better sometimes, whatever. None of that matters unless I, I sit and wallow in it for the rest of my life. And I sit and live in that dream, you know, and I always describe it as you're driving a car down the highway. You're going 200 miles an hour. Do you want to look in the rearview mirror, which is only that big? And that's all your past and live right there because you're going to crash that car. Are you going to look through the windshield, which is... 10 times or 100 times that size, and it's heading in the direction you want, and you're in the now, going in the future through the windshield. If you're looking ahead, you probably won't crash. That means you're on it. You're aware of what you're doing, and you know where you're going. A lot of guys focus on that rearview mirror, and they're like, I did this, I did that, and I'll never do that again. 
If you keep saying that, you won't. If you devise a plan and use all the tools the military gave you, you know, you never planned in the military, right? You don't know how to plan something. You don't have contingency plans. You know, you primary alternate contingency emergency plans. You always had four or five different plans. And then when those failed, you fell back on the SOPs you practice every day. Use that. Use that for everything. Use that for your new future. Do a little assessment on what do I want to do? What makes me happy? What needs done? What hole needs filled? And everyone calls us, I want to help. I want to help you. How can I help? I used to say, well, uh, uh, think. And, you know, and now I'm like, I don't know. How can you help? What do you do? What do you want to do that you can do well? And then they pause. Uh, I don't know. Okay, think about what you want to do, what you can do, and if you can do it well, and hit us back. Find out what you want to do. Find your passion. Guys are like, I don't know what to do. I don't know. What to do. You know, and Jen's like, What's your? What do you do? What's your passion? You know. Well, I play music. Okay. Why don't you play music? Well, the guys are laughing. She goes, Who gives a shit? You playing for them? You're still living in the, in the past, worried about what your guys are going to do and judge you. Take that passion and ignite it. Turn it into a job. Turn it into a career. Turn it into something you love. But don't lay there and die. You know, the greatest failure is a failure to try. So once you stop trying, that's exactly where you'll stay forever. That's what I would say, too. You know, I mean, <clears throat> a lot of these guys aren't, they're not going to know what their passion is because their passion is work. It's going to war. It's training. It's being with the guys. It's 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 the lifestyle. There's no time for any other passion. And right. so, or hobbies. I mean, shit, I still don't have any hobbies. I don't have hobbies. <laughs> to be honest with I you. I was terrified you guys asked me what my hobbies were. I'm going to make <laughs> one up. <laughs> That's funny because I, when I met my wife, she, I told her the my most feared question was, what are your hobbies? Because I don't have any. Right. Uh, yeah, I like to get shit-faced to get in bar fights. Those are my yeah, hobbies. Yeah, I do dishes and get shit-faced. <laughs> Same old thing, you know? <laughs> but, um, Cleaning. But um, it takes a minute, you know, I mean, I'm just, I'm, I'm going to talk about myself for a minute, but I mean, if you would have asked me when I was in the SEAL teams, if I'd be sitting here interviewing people uh, for the rest of my life, I'd have told you you were out of your f***ing mind, you know, <laughs> <laughs> like, I don't even like talking to people, right. but, uh, but that's what it, that's what it developed into, you know, and, and it just took trying all these different things. I didn't realize, I didn't realize how much I enjoy creativity. I mean, I built this entire set. I learned all the camera stuff. I picked the angles. I do the edit. I did the editing at the beginning. I did the trailers. I did all of that. And it just grew into this, it grew into a new passion. And that's, as you know, that's what I do today. You and know, number two passion. <clears throat> yeah. And um, it just takes a minute, but you have to, I guess what I'm saying is you have to get out and you have to try new things. Otherwise, you're never going to replace the void that you're feeling right. right now as you leave the unit or you leave the team or you leave the group or whatever, whatever your law enforcement agency, federal agency. It doesn't matter what you've immersed your life into. When you leave that, you have to try new things. Otherwise, you'll never fill the void. Right. And don't try to fill it with the exact thing or something as big. Right. Don't start there because yep. you'll feel like I'll never do something that big. I never thought I'd do anything that big again. When it's explained to me, you're probably saving more lives now than you ever would have done. You're probably helping more soldiers and warriors than you ever helped before. And I look at that thinking, all right, that's better than I'm not doing my job anymore. I'm not, you know, kicking down doors or, or leading men kicking down doors and punching paperwork, which I hate. You know, it's just I didn't want to live in the past anymore. And that's our struggle is to pull people out of the past, pull those guys out of that drinking cycle, that, that team room cycle. That, that's all they know, and that's all they want to hold on to. I mean, not probably. I don't think it's prob you probably saved more. I think you have definitely. I mean, your wife, Jen, just came on and said it's over. I think she said it's over 5,000 5, people that you guys have put through the All Secure Foundation one it, in in one way or another, yeah. and so there's five thousand something people plus their families, yeah. their kids, their friends, you know, and and the impact just spider webs out to where you can't even you can't even trace it. And why I do this now? I did it then because of Jen, right? Good looking girl starting up a thing. We're gonna get married. I started rolling into it, and then you get the letters. 
you get the thank yous. We have a letter on our refrigerator that was sent to us written in crayon, a little flower on it. I said, thank you for saving my mommy and daddy. That's why I do it. I do it because a wife stood up in a retreat and we make people write letters to each other and say one word, pick one word, and don't use brave and courageous, right? One other word that describes your spouse and tell them what you want to tell them. The spouse stands up, maybe our last retreat, that we held and says, thank you for these letters. Been married 30 years and I never knew my husband felt any of this. I'm going to frame it. I'm going to show my children, send them copies because none of us ever knew he felt this way about us. We did that with one letter. And to me, that's changing an entire generation of people. And that's why I do it now. It's a damn good reason, man. I think there's one key component that we haven't spoken about yet. You found God about a year and a half ago. Yeah. Let's talk about that experience. I grew up Lutheran, right? I was sent to school one through eight, church every Sunday, every Wednesday, studied the Bible, you know. Um, finished high school and then joined the military and all that happened. And I... I didn't ever give up God. I gave up everything I was supposed to do while knowing God. And probably, well, I kept that until about a year and a half ago, thinking I'm going to hell anyway, right? I've, I've killed people. And, and I told Jen that. I was like, you know what? I've killed people. I don't, thou shalt not kill. You know, I've done that. That's, that's a commandment. And she brought it to my attention because she's reading the Bible and studying the Bible. It says, thou shalt not murder. And I never knew that difference. And that literally gave me hope that I wasn't damned, that, you know, God hadn't rejected me. And I know he never, you know, blah, 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 and asked for forgiveness and you're good. It's hard to tell yourself that. And I started feeling better. You know, I started reading more. I, I started listening to podcasts, you know, describing the Bible. And I started texting you, you know this, you know that? She's like, yes, I know you've done. Yes, I read that and I know. And it just kept bringing me up and up and up. And if that's all that, that does, then that was amazing in itself. And just feeling that connection again with God and praying to God and feeling the differences that it makes and seeing the things that come from it. And just having those feelings was a big change back for me, um, going back to who I was, calming me down, letting me find a space to, to talk to somebody, you know, just vent and know they're hearing me. And then to feel that passion later and that love come over you. And it's just some things I've seen that have shaken me to the core, like, okay, these messages are out there. Right? They're not just happening. What kind of things? God, just the numbers, different numbers I see all the time, 33, 44, I never would have noticed, you know, ever. And then I look up, what do those mean religiously? And everybody's like, oh, it's crazy. You know, if it's crazy, okay, it's crazy. But it's happening and I see it. And it's not just happening to me. And then things, um, sitting in a hot tub one night with Jen and looking up through our backyard into the dark and we have these little, you know, the candles just sticking the ground, the tiki torches or whatever. And one was just, shaking back and forth. And Jen's like, what's, what's going on up there? But I mean, a little up by our upper deck and there was no wind blowing, it wasn't raining, but still. And this tiki torch is shaking back and forth. And I looked up at it and I was like, oh God, that's weird, what's going on, you know? And we had been talking about um, something deep in the hot tub. I don't even remember what the topic was. And this was, to me, was a sign. I looked up and I, I looked at it and I was like, oh, come on, you know? And then I looked around and I'm like, oh, there's no wind blowing. What would be making that shake? And I just screamed, stop! And it literally stopped, dead in its tracks. And I looked around and I go, no freaking way. I go, okay, I'm inside now, you know? And it was one of those things that made you nervous at first, scary at first, and then you realize, at the time, it was like we were talking about something that broke us from that conversation and stopped it. 
and I don't think we ever re re entered it, and it just brought us to another connection of what was that? That was a message, wasn't it? To looking at things like my both my parents are, are deceased now, and my father, you know, the cardinal connection, red red birds, and I'd never seen a cardinal in our yard, even though we're in St. Louis, where the cardinals are, apparently. And now they flood through our yard. They're all the time flying up. When I'm just talking to him, oh, hey, Dad, what's up? You know, and it just makes me feel better. To where my dad was into owls, owl rings. He always wanted an owl ring his entire life. They couldn't afford it. And shortly before he died, my mom finally bought him one. You know, they had the money. And I have that ring at home, and now we've had owl landing in our backyard every night. Thank goodness he's eating our moles, but he lands in the backyard every night and just kind of looks around and we talk to him, you know. To now there's two owls that come up and sit every night on a branch and hop down in our yard and hop around, look at us. We put our dogs inside so they don't chase them. And then they just hop around our yard and fly back up in a tree and stare at us and start squawking and screaming. And I'm like, this is crazy. This is crazy. And if you ignore these messages, you might as well ignore every message, right, from anybody. And I just started getting that overwhelming feeling of people well, society nowadays seems like they're turning away. And nothing good's coming from it, right? Nothing good is coming from it. And when you have a book that's been written, and it's the oldest book that this many people still follow and believe, how can you deny that, right? Non-believers, why bother? Why waste your time? It's not my job, right? God did that, there's preachers to do that. And if, you, if you're a non-believer and you wanna believe, by all means, believe, start, f do some research, whatever it takes. But I don't waste my time on non-believers. I'm not that converter guy, right? I'm not the guy that goes out and preaches and hey, you know, every time I, you come up to me, I'm not gonna talk about God to you. There's people that make me nervous like that and overly religious. I don't wanna push people away. If people are curious, I'll talk to them about God, what I know and how it makes me feel and why. But I no longer have that feeling like I'm going to hell. I feel like I've been forgiven. I know that I've been forgiven. I've come clean on things and I feel good about it. And that's, that's a better future for me, a better outlook for the future for me. And I appreciate it. And I talk to God more now. And it's more about things of family related and hopefully I mean, you're still making the right decisions. And, and, um, and I literally ask him if he ever needs any help, let me know, you know, so kind of having that relationship. Probably a lot of people freaking out right now too, hearing me say that. Well, <clears throat> maybe, but People that know me. I think that, like, whoa. Uh, <laughs> you know, I mean, what do they say? Attraction's always better than promotion. And uh, I think just by talking about your relationship with, with God, that's enough to make somebody come to him. Maybe not everybody, won't be everybody, but you got a lot of people that look up to you, man. A ton of people, whether you like to hear that or not. Veterans, guys <laughs> at the unit, guys wanting to go to the unit. I mean, people are gonna hear your story and they're gonna want to join the army and some of them will wind up at the unit because you just sat in that chair, you know? And the same thing's gonna be with people coming to God. Yeah, a lot of people are gonna dismiss it. <clears throat> they won't wanna hear it, but there'll be a handful that that's all they needed. They just needed to hear Tom Satterley talk about it. And I do think there is a, there's one thing. I mean, who do you think intervened that night in the parking garage or that day in the parking garage? Yeah, God, he does everything, so. There are no coincidences, mm -hmm. right? No. He didn't want me dead. He knew there was more for me. And I know that now. I know that now. That my days weren't over. My, I hadn't done my best yet. And he kept me around long enough to see that. Do you feel like you're doing your best now? I'm trying. I'm always trying to do my best. Is it my best? Mm, no, I'll always keep trying to do better. Well, Tom, it's been a hell of an interview, man. It's been a long one, and um, I just want to say I know that I know it took you 20 years to even talk about what happened in Mogadishu. 
to come out publicly and talk about that and and I know you're tired of talking about it and I just want to say man and I mean this from the bottom of my heart it was a real honor to be able to get you here to talk about that to document it and then everything that came afterwards and and um I just wish you and your wife Jen the best of luck and uh you guys are doing amazing things and Thank you for your time. Thank you for being here. And uh, it's an honor to get to know you. Thank you. I really appreciate you having us on and giving us the opportunity to share with more and reach more people. This is the opportunity we've been looking for, to reach as many people in need as we can. So thank you. The honor is all mine, brother. Hey everybody, I'm Sean Ryan. Click here to subscribe to the Sean Ryan Show YouTube channel for the hottest and most compelling interviews that you will not see anywhere else. I've also made a playlist of all the previous SRS episodes so they're easy to find. You can find that right here.